Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the last day of the conference. Uh, my name is Terje Eriksdal. I am financial news editor in this newspaper, um, Dagens Næringsliv. Today, the, the theme of the conference is vested interests. Our next speaker is uh, Tina Søreide. Uh, she is a research fellow in law and economics at the University of Bergen. And she uh, has worked for the World Bank in Washington on its governance and anti-corruption agenda. And she is educated at this place uh, with a PhD in economics. Uh, we are now looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Um, uh, so far, we have got a fairly good sense of the financial secrecy map. This map from Tax Justice Network is pr probably familiar to many of you. Uh, it combines measure, a measure of laws and regulations, uh, with the the, the, they are the green bubbles, uh, with a measure of uh, the jurisdiction size and importance in the world, uh, in the world economy. And as you can see, there are many green bubbles in the OECD, uh, area and uh, during this conference we have got that confirmed that there are many problems with secrecy within the OECD jurisdictions not only it's not only an issue in small islands um, within the OECD area we, we don't only have bad legislation as uh, Tim Daniels among others pointed out that we are not even fi enforcing the financial transparency laws that we do have we have heard that the impacts are most serious for developing countries, but as Frian Orsnes uh, pointed out on Tuesday, um, OECD countries are really starting to, to feel the leakage. Um, we also heard that secrecy is not only about tax avoidance and evasion, uh, it facilitates other forms of crime as well, as pointed out by, by Guttom Sheldrup on Tuesday. And George Papandreou uh, underscores that it that it threatens democracy and uh, the function of important state institutions. So, uh, what is it that we can add about resistance in the South? You have seen, uh, Tim Daniels already mentioned some of these um, uh, dictators, um, and perhaps you can recognize them. But there must be more, more to this. Uh, for instance, there is a reason why they came to power in the first place. Um, and one of those reasons is that they were not alone. Um, they were brought to the top by a network of allies uh, who get richer because they benefit from being allies. Um, so we are not only dealing with a dictator and, and, and isolated cases, we are dealing with networks. Um, and it can be really difficult to tell who's part of this network and who are eager to be part of it. And thus, we don't really know who we can trust. And for members of these networks, we know that there will be resistance against initiatives that make uh, grabbing difficult, initiatives that make it more difficult to hide stolen money, financial transparency in general. And we know very clearly that capital flight, money laundering, hidden funds, it is all somewhat associated with political corruption. Um, however, <laughs> when it comes to these networks and these powerful people, it can be difficult to prove that what they do is illegal, because what we know uh, is that they can, they can change the laws so that their acts are, they are illegitimate, yet legal. So we have to address not only um, illegal transactions, but illegitimate governments. And this is the definition from Farouk Al-Qasim, uh, a, a f person from Iraq who helped Norwegians develop the oil regulation institutions. Uh, he says that we can, the political corruption uh, can be defined as the manipulation of legal and institutional framework conditions to attain exclusive benefits to individuals or groups at the cost of social benefits. And these are the names of these 
in case you wanted. So, if resistance against financial transparency has something to do with corruption, we have to combine different maps to get a full picture of the problem. This corruption perceptions index, as you are well aware of all of you, um, is not very well able to capture political corruption, but it gives us a sense of the cross-country variation. As Eva Shuli would have pointed out, if she was here, because she says it every time she gets an opportunity, is that the fight against financial secrecy implies a fight against corruption. So, but if we get this, if when we compare these two maps from Tax Justice Network and Transparency International, um, we see that they are very different, the problems appear to be very different. Red is more serious on both maps. Um, green bubbles are the most interesting in this context. Uh, but when we look at these two maps, you can easily get the impression that, that um, the corruption problems in the South benefit tax havens in the North. So, so even if political corruption has been mentioned several times during these days, I think it can be useful to, to, to consider how we deal with this a bit more systematically. Uh, why is it so difficult to get rid of it um, when whole populations want to get rid of it? Um, and this is a question I have studied in, in, in different ways, um, in statistically, uh, theoretical analysis of incentive problems, market analysis, political economy analysis. I've been traveling, I've been, done more than 200 face-to-face -face interviews in developing countries, all on corruption. And that's a lot if you know what Lagos traffic jam looks like. <laughs> um, so I will discuss four categories of reasons. Uh, democracy, law enforcement, uh, international anti-corruption initiatives, and incentive problems in, uh, in among governments. So, uh, democracy is a good thing. Uh, it correlates strongly with um, G high GDP le levels and happiness. Uh, but we all know that democratic reform in a developing country is not a guarantor of success. Um, the accountability we hope to see is associated with the propensity of politicians and decision ma makers to act in accordance with the expressed preferences of the population and in respect of, of legal rules and institutions. And such accountability requires some form of dialogue between the decision makers and the people. Citizens' opinions should be shaped in active communication among different players in society, particularly the press, civil society, political parties. If these activities are not encouraged or actively discouraged, we don't really have a democracy even if elections are being held. And other governments should be careful to consider the government legitimate. However, even when it works, even, even we ha when we have this kind of dialogue, voters cannot really be trusted to remove bad politicians by punish them in the next election, of course. Voters judge politicians on a whole range of issues other than raw performance. Some voters uh, will we'll vote for a certain political party, what, whoever the candidate is. Some will vote for charismatic leaders, female leaders to improve the gender balance in politics, specific results that matter to them, promises of a reform that will never happen. They can be myopic and simply forgotten about the failures of the incumbent, or they will vote for a new candidate who does the same mistakes as the former. Um, so, democracy um, well, the politicians have to be really bad for voters to certainly remove, remove, uh, remove them. And in those situations, it's sometimes too late because they've managed to bolster their power in, in these uh, networks of allies. So democracy may prevent these kind of problems, but it's not very efficient in terms of fixing political corruption. 
consider Angola, for example. I have done studies on political corruption and how it distorts the construction sector in Angola. Um, and, and our research partners, they call it a democracy. Uh, I have... I have been there, I've been cl several times and collaborated closely with citizens. Um, I've seen the poverty. Uh, and nevertheless, I have been a bit surprised to see it at the bottom of all rankings. I, I, I wanted to look carefully about what does all these indices tell us about Angola. And it was, it is at the bottom on human rights, life expectancy, income differences, press freedom, corruption, governance, effectiveness. And I was surprised about governance effectiveness because they have, they have an oil industry. So I was thinking it should be some technology transfers at least. Um, and it on income differences uh, and regulatory quality, cost of doing business is extremely high um, and capital flight. Um, so. Um, but the bad index results is not really a problem for the decision makers because countries like Norway is doing, they do business with them. Now, I have to say also that the oil workers in, the Angolan oil workers, they, they, they love to work for the Norwegian oil company, Statoil. They get labor unions and security. However, when for Norway as a country, I think this is one of the, uh, we are a small uh, uh, oil-producing, peace-promoting country, and this is one of our most challenging international, uh, in, uh, biggest challenges internationally. So if, if democracy doesn't deliver, what about better laws, better regulation, better administration? Wouldn't that indirectly lead to better politics? Um, as Gutton pointed out on Tuesday, good institutions are essential for development. Of course, that is true only as far as they work. A new law is not enough. Um, and I have seen many places how difficult legal reform can be. I visited Albania in 2002 and to teach public procurement. And they had EU laws passed, but they didn't translate them. Nobody could read the law. <laughs> I met uh, the new independent regulating institutions in the Philippines. They had excellent new laws reflecting international best practice. But when the regulators acted independently, they got a wage cut. Um, in Malawi, I was task managing for the World Bank a project on construction transparency and we had a, we we really tried to convince the government to increase transparency in construction contracts contracts um, but if you had minister meetings and 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 they told us that we have to protect the commercial secrets for the private sector but when we asked the private sector they were fine about transparency I studied per diem regulations in Tanzania and some other countries last year. And what we saw, legal, for, legal reform means training. And it became so evident that many civil servants came for the per diem. Of course, not all of them, but many of them, they come from, for the per diem and not really for the training. Um, in Nigeria, I was collaborating with a uh, um, Alex Geboyega, a researcher, and he did a study of audit offices. And when he visited all the states, to, 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 he wanted to visit the, the, the audit offices. And even he was surprised to see that many of the audit offices was only a mailbox. It was a hut. It was nothing there. And this picture, this photo, is taken, it was a uh, construction site near a hotel I stayed at in Addis last year. And uh, you can see that the scaffolding is made out of wood and construction workers. They, it, we had this, was ki this kind of construction sites all over the city. And people fell down, the construction workers fell down uh, and they died and they were replaced. And it was, 
it was much cheaper to replace them than to, to, to improve security. And that sad fact continues regardless of legislation. Of, of, of course, I'm underscoring something here, and it's not all like this in all situations, but at least better laws will not always deliver. So if we think of this a bit more systematically, uh, we can think of what, what counts, under what circumstances will, will a new law bring change? And if we can think that we can, we can place countries along two axes, one where we, we put the qualities of laws and regulations, and the other we put the strength of law enforcement. Up in this corner, we will have the strong performance, those who have good laws, um, good enforcement, their participation in international initiatives are important to, to, to get the uh, initiatives up and going, um, uh, but they don't really need it because they are always there. Um, many legal reforms are introduced as if countries are here, as if they are eager, uh, eager for new reforms, they just don't, they just don't have the rules. Um, in reality, they are here, they have laws. And uh, this is something I've looked at in many different sectors. If we look at the procurement laws, uh, the se sector regulation laws, they are often quite good because they have been copied from other countries. A law re uh, legal reform will not just make a change be because the laws that were there at the first place, they were not respected. And sadly, uh, for this, for this uh, category of countries, we, that's where we have the biggest challenge. We, we don't really have any, any, any good solutions. Um, and then, okay, so of course laws do work in some situations. I'm just trying to put it, uh, make an argument. Um, now, if we consider the international anti-corruption initiatives, how well are they able to, to, to help us get rid of political corruption? So, one of the things that are actually quite influential are the governance indicators. Many think of that as just an indicator, corruption perception indicator, but they have been very important in raising awareness. They make, uh, they, they, make they, they force a kind of comparison with other countries, uh, politicians, the press in many countries, they, they write about it, and, um, and, um, and, and, and the governments are forced to explain why they don't do better this year. Um, but unfortunately, there's not an element of sanctions for the, political, for the politicians and the decision makers in these indices. Um, and then we have the UN Convention and other, other international laws as well. Um, it, um, it has many rules that it improves international collaboration on anti-corruption. It has rules to exchange of information. It, 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 it makes it possible to, to reverse the burden of proof. Um, it has rules for asset recovery. Unfortunately, it's not much applied. And Edgardo Puscalia, uh, a researcher at Columbia University, that did a study his, um, of its impact. And, and, and his main conclusion is that it depends on political will. There we go. Um, so, and then there has been a lot of efforts to make ethical codes of conduct work. The UN Global Compact is one initiative among many. Um, and of course, it may have an impact on the companies, uh, but it doesn't really influence contract allocation. If contract allocation is determined by corruption, your ethical codes of conduct will not necessarily help you. Um, and it will not necessarily change because the contracts will be allocated. Um, when it comes to the legal initiatives against cross-border bribery, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the US, the US and the OECD Anti-Bribery and the um, Security and Exchange Commission, these are initiatives that companies fear a lot. They, they really have an impact on, on company behavior now. 
many, many at least. Uh, uh, the problem is that they don't reach, they don't reach the politicians. We know <laughs> you, you, the World Bank has this um, debarment list. They, black, they, they debar companies from getting contracts on World Bank financed. Um, uh, uh, they, they, they cannot get, get World Bank finance contracts in any country if they are found guilty in, among other things, collusion and corruption. Uh, and in those cases, the World Bank uh, sends the evidence to the governments, to a developing country, very often a developing country government, but it never reacts. There's not a response. They don't bring the cases to court in the countries. Um, and uh, I happened to be at, in the Philippines once um, when, when a big, really big infrastructure scandal was, uh, came into the media. It, was in, it had been investigated over several years and it became known when I was there. And political corruption was revealed. It was a case that had been investigated by World Bank investigators. And, and, uh, and I, was, uh, I was curious to see what would... Uh, I was assuming that the government would would um, react and start to their own investigation. However, in the media and the reactions from the president was, it, I was surprised, he said, we can always find a new development bank. <laughs> that was the reaction. Um, sector, we have, we already mentioned EITI, but there are many sector transparency initiatives now. And these are, of course, all like the other initiatives, they are important steps in, an, in, in the right direction. Uh, however, all of them are, um, they go only as far as the political elite allows, because the design is shaped a little differently from country to country, and, and um, they, don't, they don't really threaten. They, they give us more information, but they don't really threaten those who have positions. They don't lead to court cases. Uh, besides, they're run by multi-stakeholder groups and um, where all the players are involved in running the initiative. And in those groups, there are a lot of veto powers and it's difficult to make them work efficiently. Mm. So, if, if none of these initiatives really address and combat political corruption, we cannot, we cannot really expect that the sum of them will, uh, will make them work. Um, so what about other governments? Uh, on Tuesday, one lady from Tanzania, uh, maybe you, uh, said that who can, who can citizens of a poor country rely on when their politicians are corrupt and steal from the state revenues, when, when all these other initiatives don't work? Who, who can we rely on? Um, and um, um, other governments, offer development aid and promote very, very important initiatives. But it is difficult to, um, to fight political corruption by offering money. Um, the private sector, they have corporate social responsibility initiatives. But the contracts in countries where corruption is a big problem are more profitable. The reason is, of course, that the contracts are not allocated because of the best price quality combinations. They are all allocated on some other criteria, which is uh, uh, private. And, and, in those, and then they can, the companies can get better terms as well. In countries where corruption is a big problem, it is also much easier for companies to collude. The, com the control on competition is weak. This is a very strong. Um, so, so it's a very strong. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a great opportunity for companies to profit more in uh, when when there is corruption, and that is often forgotten when we talk. It's not should I go into Nigeria or should I go into Sweden? It's not a. It's these are not equal like, alternatives. Um, Nigeria can be more profitable. Um, so and for governments. They, they, want to, they want to keep a good dialogue with governments 
uh, among other, they want to, 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 to use that as an opportunity to help people and, and reduce poverty, obviously. But they also want access to resources, or they don't want other countries to get access to the resources. Um, they want their firms to get contracts abroad, um, or they want to keep military collaboration with the incumbent um, uh, government, or the they want to protect the military collaboration with the French, uh, the, the French military um, uh, alliances. So, so there are so many different objectives. There are so, um, uh, so governments cannot be relied on when it comes to removing uh, political corruption either. And the fact that we are lenient on tax havens is probably the main reason um, why these many anti-corruption initiatives have not delivered as much as we have hoped for. So when we started the fight against corruption in the mid-90s, mid early 2000, it was really about 15, 20 years ago, we, we didn't think this would be such a big problem when we got this far. We thought we would see more results. And one reason we have not seen more results is the secrecy, financial secrecy. Um, so, like Olaf Lundteigen said uh, uh, on Tuesday, many things are really moving in the right direction. And I have skipped a lot of nuances about what works well. Um, but it is a fact, um, and it has been mentioned several times, that, that we, don't have, we don't have good enough solutions. Uh, we don't really know how to deal with political corruption internationally. We have, we have to start think differently about uh, about many of the uh, of the, of these issues, and for example, uh, the political economy issues. Uh, when I was at the World Bank, um, um, we we were talking about political economy issues or incentive problems in governments, or or we we we. We didn't really call it corruption because that is a legal term. So, so, so the, my impression is that the development community is very careful about calling uh, political corruption, uh, political um, incentive problems, corruption, and they don't, uh, they don't really think of this as crime, and it is crime. Um, Political corruption is a crime, and what we have learned from the uh, what we have learned from the <coughs> literature on crime is that sanctions work. Uh, the risk of being apprehended and re it works, um, and um, we have to think differently uh, about our com commercial collaboration. It's not fine if if it harms people elsewhere. Here in Norway, when somebody is getting, has, uh, are, are caught in cor a corruption case elsewhere, they, they, they again and again, they say, but that's part of the business culture in that country. They say that uh, it, is, it, is, it was legal before, but it was legal when we did it. And when they, what they mean by th when they say that is that we were not prosecuted in Norway for the crimes we did in another country. And then I said, it, this was legal. And that, this is something we hear again and again, as if bank robbery in uh, Portugal would be okay if I'm not prosecuted in Norway. It's a kind of something about the way we think. And of course, when you meet a business agent mm, in a developing country, and they said, and he says, uh, this is how we do things in this country, it's part of the culture. Well, <laughs> he's part of this network, of course he says it's part of the culture, but it undermines what the country tries to achieve, and corruption has been illegal in all countries, business corruption has been illegal in all countries, as long as they've had bureaucracy. It's, it's very, there are some cases where some forms of corruption is not that Illig as illegal as a lot of places, but generally it has been illegal all over the world in, uh, for a very long time. Um, and um, we have to also think differently when it comes to development collaboration, um, because one of the things we see is that 
many of the problems are up north, but the OECD says um, development agencies cannot spend money on their own institutions. So if we want to support developing countries, we cannot spend the money on, on institutions that could promote financial transparency in our own countries, even if that would be important to, to assist. So I think that is some of the, we have to think differently about how, how, we, how we can, 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 can use development um, aid for, for, to reduce uh, financial secrecy. Um, so more specifically, how to deal with it. Um, when it comes to identifying the resistance, um, we, need to, we need to understand who are against, that we need to identify the institutions and ministries. We need to, to, to know the wealth of the advisors, uh, what job offers they have. Um, w those who make an argument for financial secrecy um, they have a reason to do it, as uh, Frian Osnes <laughs> pointed out earlier. We have to act when possible. And, and we, that's not an obvious thing to say, because as we have seen, the, lo the, f the, the laws that we do have are not really enforced. Um, we need to request information from firms, banks and governments in much greater uh, extent than we do now. I think it was very fascinating to see this new Magnitsky law, uh, where a lawyer in uh, Russia had been, been uh, was killed, and he happened to work for a rich investor who has been traveling around to other to various countries to demand a law that restricts the uh, travel uh, opportunities and and uh, spending opportunities for the people who were involved in this case. And uh, in many countries there are now uh, uh, passing this Magnitsky law as a reaction to that specific case. And that is an example of acting when possible, possible because they have the ev evidence. Mm. Another thing is bargaining power means responsibility. Uh, Alison Christians uh, um, said, um, yesterday that we, we need to have a more nuanced view on sovereignty. Mm. And, um, um, and I think we need to put a much, uh, heavy conditionality on integrity mechanisms when it is possible. So we have to think of when is it possible? Uh, who are in position to demand integrity? This is a question of bargaining power and some people have uh, technology. Some big companies have technology. Um, some institutions offer aid. Some institutions offer loans. And as far as I can see, their bargaining position means responsibility. So those who are in position to demand integrity should do it. That's something we should expect. Um, but that's also one of the things that I think we have to think differently about. Um, I want to say that we should not avoid the politics. And this, um, this is, um, of course, based on experience from the World Bank, where, where politics is very often avoided. But also for those, there are some people here from Oil for Development. Um, we should think of uh, legitimate governance as a precondition for sector regulation to work. When I did a study of um, the political economy of the mining sector in Ghana, and, uh, and, and they had checks and balances on paper. Um, when, the, when the mining, the application for mining concessions was sent from the, from exec it was sent to, to the government, and then it was the envelope with these um, concessions, applications, were sent to the parliamentary committee, the parliamentarians, they didn't even open the envelope because they had been instructed by the executive what to say. So they didn't even open the, they didn't even look at the applications. So, that, so they had checks and balances on paper, but not in practice. <laughs> um, so, so, and this, uh, um, 
uh, tendency to avoid politics is really something that we have to deal with. We have to, we have to address uh, politics and not act as if illegitimate uh, governments are, we should not recognize them as much as we do. Um, another thing, we have to demand fair markets. Um, one of the things that I have studied in my, in my study research on corruption is the, cor the linkages between market power and corruption. And, and um, we, cannot we cannot understand business uh, corruption without understanding um, uh, where, the rents, we ha where the rents are coming from. And um, uh, there have been much talk about the natural resource, uh, rent from natural resources, but in the utility sectors we see that um, market power is created to, very often created to generate rents for, 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 for the political elite and in other, in other markets as well, but it's very visible in, in, um, in the utilities and the construction sector as well. Um, and for the companies, um, I, I get a bit upset. I've visited many uh, conferences on, on, on corporate social responsibility, and um, and they seem to and they seem to think again and again that compliance is enough. Um, they they consider what do we have to do to act within the law, uh, but they should have to start demanding. Uh, um, a market where they don't have to consider the question of corruption. They have to demand framework conditions that, that makes it obvious that the contracts are allocated fairly. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that we have to make use of democracy and that means that we have to make voters in the North understand how their tax burden is increasingly getting heavier. Uh, so that they have to, they have to realize they have to support initiatives for financial transparency. I think I stop it here. I, I guess the audience uh, yes. are very eager to uh, ask you some questions. I think the gentleman up here were. Thank you. I'm Terry from South Africa. You opened your presentation with a map that showed the perceptions of Africa as highly corrupt. But these, of course, are perceptions from the North, where I would suggest that corruption is so institutionalized it's not even recognized as such. And particularly the British banking and armaments industry would be a case in point. So for instance, in 1998, when I asked the British government to investigate whether BAE was bribing our politicians, it wasn't illegal in English law to bribe foreigners. And a few years later, the minister says, oh, bribes of 115 million pounds were reasonable under the circumstances, reasonable. <laughs> uh, but you referred also to the World Bank program to debar companies that bribe. Mm. And that comes out of Lesotho, if you will, from the Lesotho Highlands Water Scheme, which was funded by the World Bank, and where major international contractors were bribing local officials to cast a blind eye to local regulatory um, mm. uh, requirements. And they were outraged when Lesotho took, took on this issue. And the judge says, I don't care whether it's in English law, German law, Canadian law, whatever, the damage done was in Lesotho. Of this tiny little country with, surrounded by South Africa, the damage done, and so the judge took jurisdiction this where, the, where, the, where the, the World Banks, and the World Bank initially was outraged by it. But thankfully it has made some remains, we would hope. But this is what we're facing, that so often it is a, a European company aligned with government that finds a local useful uh, agent the Mobutus, the Kabilas, the Mugabes, to, to, to be the front man. And then it's Africa that's left with the consequences. So I'm afraid we've got to also deal with Europe and the corruption that is so institutionalized in Europe before we can tackle that uh, corruption in Africa. A couple of uh, very brief uh, comments. First, on the Corruption Perception Index. It's an invention of the corporate community which wants to put the blame not on the bribe payer, but on the bribe recipient. And that was deliberate. And it was done when Transparency International was created. 
Now, good people have come into Transparency International, but they don't know how this got started. And the entire index is phony. And I'll, I'll go into that with anyone who wants to discuss it. Item two, there is no substitute for prosecution. In World War II, in Denmark, the Nazis arrested all the Danish police. They didn't trust them. There was a crime wave in Denmark. Hmm. Now, that should tell you no cops, no prosecution, crime. And it doesn't matter where on earth you're talking about it. Number three, asset recovery. There's no substitute for going after the money. The World Bank could put a condition on its loans saying if this loan money is stolen, we'll recover it. I brought that up in multiple World Bank sessions. They say, we can't do that. That would be an interference with sovereignty. Excuse me, mm -hmm. structural adjustment isn't? <laughs> Why doesn't the World Bank act? The executive directors are the relatives of the people who are stealing the money. Think you, about that. Yeah. So, so this gentleman here. Uh, Robert Palmer from Global Witness. Um, a lot of my work looks at the um, exactly what you're talking about, regulations of books but not implemented. Uh, and this is not in the poorest countries in the world, but in some of the richest countries in the world, where it comes to the money laundering regulations, which uh, every country in the world almost has, but they're very badly implemented uh, in almost every country, including the rich countries. So if rich countries can't get regulation and enforcement right, how can we expect developing countries to do the same? Mm, thank you very much for interesting comments. Um, when it comes to, first, the, the, the indexes. Um, I know the background of the, of the Transparency International's index, um, but a very similar index is uh, developed by the World Bank, and it doesn't have the. It, it, it is not made uh, to protect industry, um, and it is the, it is not generated on the perceptions of U Europeans. It is it is uh, constructed on by by. Um, it uses many different service, uh, surveys, and it collects a lot of information, most of the information actually, from people in the, in the countries. So, so it's, not, um, it's not reflecting a European perception. Um, and um, and it's, uh, it's very difficult to prove that it, the levels are correct, but, um, but it is supported by many different, because I have been very critical of these indexes myself, and I wrote a paper, it's wrong to rank, and, uh, and, um, and explained the weaknesses, but, but at the same time, it seemed to, to reflect many of the, of, the, of the variations across countries, uh, but mostly on facilitation payments, actually, and not really on political corruption. Um, when it comes to the Lesotho case that you mentioned, um, I think one of the most depressing things about that case is um, that they, that they uh, hired a World Bank expert to, to oversee the case. And uh, they considered this person uh, uh, with high integrity. And uh, he got a very high wage in order so that he should not be tempted by corruption. And still, we got this case. So he, he actually took bribes even even so, so, so it was a big disappointment also for that reason. Um, when it comes to corruption in Europe, uh, I totally agree. But as I mentioned in the beginning, that I would focus on the South um, in this presentation, and I have been working on development issues most, mostly. So that was also a natural thing to do. However, Transparency International Europe has recently conducted integrity studies all over Europe. Uh, really careful studies. They have considered how well able are the European uh, institu are institutions all over Europe. They have studied carefully more than 300 institutions. How well are able are we to, to, to prevent political corruption in Europe? And I have to say the results were depressing. It, the risk of political corruption in Europe is high. That was the big conclusion coming out of it. And, and this survey it, it doesn't just say that political corruption is a problem. It says, it says it's, it goes really into detail 
and explains why there is a significant risk of political cor corruption in European countries. So that's absolutely something I would support. And on asset recovery, the incentives to follow up on the, on the to actually go <coughs> and, and could conduct, to do, enforce the laws, is not in place. They are not in place. So it's not only a lack of willingness, but but there's nobody really got incentives to do the work. So 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 that's that's something, and that's why I was mentioning this. Maybe this could is something we should think differently about in development, in the development um, community. So. I think we should allow one more question, and then uh, you can have the final word. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello. Yes, God listen from Tanzania, Christian Social Services Commission working. Uh, my interest is on uh, corruption has been decorated with so many uh, names and so many ways. And lawyers seem to compromise uh, with corruptions. Uh, why am I saying this? Taking case of Tanzania, uh, the most of the uh, investment contracts that have been signed is on the ground of the uh, legal advice. And they have um, brought a dramatic problem in our country. Uh, what is your personal advice to the civil society uh, organizations that uh, they should take which step uh, to solve or to, 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 to make sure that this uh, does not continue. Thank you. Uh, on this specific question, what is the advice to civil society organizations? Well, I think it's very important to attend conferences like this one because uh, financial issues have been seen as, um, they are very complex. So very often uh, corruption has been, uh, can, can take place without any risk of reactions from civil society because they don't understand the complexity of the issues. I think it's, as it is really, it's, uh, it's difficult myself. So I think knowledge, and, and, and try to get access to information. And, um, but my experience when I collaborate with, uh, with researchers uh, in developing countries is that, um, and also civil society, they are, they are very worried to ask for information. Um, in many countries, they, it, it's a very difficult thing. And, e and myself, I, I have also um, uh, asked for a lot of information that is supposed to be public, and, and we don't get it. We, it's not given to us. So, 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 we may well say that you, so, so, so requesting information in all possible ways and knowledge to process it is extremely important for civil society organizations and collaboration with journalists, of course. Um, um, I want to just respond to one of the other, other questions. Okay. Is that okay? One, one because minute. I was asked why the World Bank doesn't act. And I have to say that even if the World Bank, some parts of World Bank, uh, institutions may act as if they were commercial UN organizations. Um, they um, they do they really try to 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 fight poverty in 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 in. But but the World Bank is a big organization and it can go only as far as its members allows. It is it is run by countries and these countries steer the World Bank. When I was there, I real I thought I could try to influence things in the World Bank, but I realized that if I should influence the World Bank, I will have to influence my own government. So, so the World Bank is a, a quite complex in that sense. Um, so I'm sorry for overgeneralizing, and this presentation was not on one specific issue, it was a combination of many different issues, and I wanted to go systematically through these uh, difficulties. Uh, so, but of course, many nuances were missing. Thank you very much. As a journalist, I'm really looking forward to the next presentation. Uh, Mr. Stephen Baker is, uh, as I said, uh, an English barrister and Jersey advocate. He is senior partner of Baker and Partners Jersey, uh, which is a Channel Island. Uh, he is a specialist in concluding investigations into the flow of suspected corrupt payments made to politicians through Jersey. He also has expertise in cases involving complex fraud and money laundering. And Mr. Beck will now talk about some practical experiences in an offshore jurisdiction. The floor is yours. Good. Thank you. Good. I, he's stolen my first line. Because <laughs> I was going to say that um, I hoped that 
by the end of my talk we might have some grounds for optimism. And I don't think that the, the Lesotho case, for instance, is a particularly negative case. I think it's a great case because a small jurisdiction took on some big companies, it took on a particularly a Canadian firm and it stuck it to them and that Canadian firm suffered consequences and Lesotho said we won't tolerate corruption and I think that a starting point is for, for me is that it is possible to do something and that small countries can also play their part uh, as well as the big ones and every jurisdiction needs to address the issue that it, face, that it faces particularly and it needs to take steps to deal both with corruption and with tax evasion, which are two topics which I've become very familiar uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. I'm an English lawyer and I'm a Jersey advocate. I'm a litigation lawyer, means I'm a courtroom specialist. I've watched certain of the speakers who obviously speak very regularly strutting around the floor very confidently, a bit like American game show hosts. <laughs> well, <coughs> I'm, a, I'm a courtroom lawyer and we're, we're told to stand still near our lectern and that's where I'm going to stay for the next 45 minutes unless I need to start dodging things. Um, I've had the great good fortune, as I say, to um, have a lot of experience on um, corruption, asset recovery, and tax evasion. That's what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, I've had the privilege to act for the Republic of Brazil in a case I'll talk to you about, as well as the National Accountability Bureau of Pakistan. Yes, there is one. Um, <laughs> and the Kenyan Anti-Corruption Commission, as well as wor working with Tim Daniel and others on a, a series of Nigerian cases. But I guess that the first thing that lots of you will be thinking is, who on earth is that bloke over there and where is he from? Um, well, I live on Jersey. It's not New Jersey, which is in the United States. It's the old Jersey, the one that New Jersey is named after. And it's a tiny little island off the coast of France. You can see France from um, Jersey, but everybody or virtually everybody speaks English, save for a few old people who speak a, a form of patois. French and it's one of those really weird places that ended up with the with Queen Elizabeth II as the um, head of um, head of state, and it's also ended up with a very substantial finance industry. And I thought it might help you just a little bit if I told you told you how that happened. And it, it's a joy to be here in Norway. It's the purest country in the world. There's no corruption. There's no tax evasion. <laughs> Well, I, I can tell you that, in fact, the, the Norwegians are directly responsible for the tax haven, which is Jersey, because um, <coughs> well over a thousand years ago, the Vikings went down to the north coast of France and they conquered uh, part of it, and it was called Normandy after the Norsemen, after the after the, the men from the north, and Jersey was part of, I'm exaggerating, part of Norway, of course it wasn't, but it was part of the Duke of Normandy's territories. And the Duke of Normandy in 1066 invaded England and conquered England. So every good Englishman will tell you that, uh, sorry, every good Jerseyman will tell you that uh, Jersey conquered England. <coughs> but it was a, a long time ago. Do, uh, do, do, do people like um, Hollywood films, like the Robin, the Robin Hood films, the Kevin Costner Robin Hood film? Well, he fought against King John, didn't he? Bad King John in England. But John lost all of the Norman ter all, all of the Norman territories, all of the France in 1204, he lost it. And for reasons nobody knows, Jersey, this little island of France, remained loyal to King John. And he's called Good King John, would you believe it, in, uh, in Jersey. And John was so pleased with the Jersey citizens that he said to them, thanks guys, that's really great. I don't know why you've stayed loyal to me, but because you have, I'm going to give you a number of um, rights. He said, firstly, you can raise your own taxes and I won't tax you. You can look after yourself, something which didn't really matter in 1204. <laughs> and he said, secondly, um, my army will protect you. Whenever you need protection, the English army will be there. And there it stood for 600, 700 years until 1940 when the German army had gone through France and was on the doors of 
Jersey, and Jersey said to England for the first time in six, seven hundred years, help us, help us, we need an army. And Winston Churchill made a very famous speech, which was, we will defend the beaches of Kent, which wasn't much use to Jersey because it was 120 miles <coughs> <laughs> south of the beaches of Kent. And of course, a very sensible military decision, but um, not much good for the Jersey people. Then after the Second World War, some bright spark in Jersey realised that in 1204, King John had said to them, well, you can raise your own taxes. And they'd always followed the English tax rate until then. And somebody realised, we've had a bad war, we've got no industry, we're in a terrible state, um, but we can raise our own tax. And in 50 years, an enormous financial services business has been developed on this t tiny little island, 12 miles or 13 miles by seven at its widest with very, very large sums of money on it, and what you're, you're calling a typical tax haven. Now, the, word ta the words tax haven never get used in Jersey. They're terrible words, and the, the, the proper description is a well-regulated, low-tax area. <coughs> <laughs> so that's, that, that's, what we're, that's where I'm from. That's where I, I live, and I, pra and I practice from. And I, I thought carefully about what I was going to say today, and I listened to the speakers from the Australian yesterday, uh, Jason, and our American colleague in the afternoon, and I listened to Jack, and I then read through my PowerPoint slides and realised, actually, I've got it. I'm just about in the game as to what I want to say and what I should say. And so what I'd like to do is pull together what I think they said and what I want to say to you, and then I want to really get into some practical examples of why I say... There are, there are some grounds to be, to be positive about things. Firstly, picking up on what Jack said and responsibility. It's a responsibility of lawyers, it's a responsibility of jurisdictions to deal with the issues of corruption which we face, which the whole world faces. And those jurisdictions who have a rule of law and have a judge that you can trust and system of judges that you can trust have a responsibility, one, to prosecute those who misuse their financial services, and two, to put their courts at the uh, use of those that want to recover assets. And so that for those of us, <coughs> well, the Norwegians that are here, if your companies pay bribes, prosecute them. If your citizens evade tax, then prosecute them. If the money goes through, London, then there's a responsibility on the English to be prosecuting those that use their banks to launder the, the tax evaded money or corrupt money. And if it comes to Jersey or other centres, then it's their responsibility to make sure that, their that those that misuse their financial services are prosecuted and that assets are recovered. And picking up on, as Jason said, the, the, our Australian academic said, it's no use just having laws. The international community has been very good at putting pressure on all sorts of uh, different jurisdictions to introduce laws, and most countries now have the laws. How they're enforced is entirely patchy, and there's a responsibility on countries to make sure not only they have their laws, but that they're used and that they're tested, and that there are proper audit, regulatory audit of um, whether laws are carried out. And I asked Jason yesterday how the Jersey Trust and Company service providers perform, performed on his tests. Do you remember him trying to set up the offshore companies and like? He said 100, they got 100%. They always wanted a passport and a utility bill. Now, that's not a complete answer. Of course it isn't, because he also told me the Seychelles and Caymans passed, which astonished me. Um, but it, it's important to have laws properly tested. And if you, you'd be surprised by this, but if you went and walked around the streets of Jersey, um, the complaint you'd hear from the financial services industry is there's too much regulation. There's too much regulation. The regulators all over us. We can't do business because they're insisting on us complying with um, all sorts of international standards and the like. I'm not here, I'm far from it, to tell you that Jersey's a perfect jurisdiction. Of, 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 of course it's not. Um, but what is important, I, re I repeat, for the last time is that laws are enforced and that people take this all seriously. One of the last things I, I wanted just to comment upon briefly before I move to um, perhaps some practical examples is this. I think that 
it's important that you think about offshore more broadly. What, what is offshore? Because it's a mistake to think that offshore is your typical tropical island with some palm trees and some banks. And to think, well, that's, if, 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 we wipe out, if we wipe out all of those, we're going to solve the world's problems. In my view, it's a lot more complicated than that. And the city of London is offshore to almost everybody here, as is New York, as is the Netherlands, as is Ireland. And it's a, a much more complicated problem than saying, oh, these little islands cause all this trouble, because you need to be focusing on the, um, on the big jurisdictions in the first instance. If you don't persuade the Americans, and if you don't persuade the British to shift that position, then it's not realistic to think that small jurisdictions are going to shift without that uh, international um, move. Not all, I'm now going to talk about um, traditional offshore centres, what you imagine to be, off, to be offshore centres. Firstly, want to say this, that you can go to London and get your shell company, your trust, and all the services, effectively all the services that you want from London. And it's not even regulated. The trust and corporate services providers aren't regulated in London. And it's important, in my view, that there is proper regulation so that laws are tested. But it was said yesterday that we're, I think, 900,000 BVI companies, or something like that. Well, there's a reason that there's 900,000 BVI companies, and that's because the British Virgin Islands Company Registry doesn't have the beneficial owner of those companies. That's why people incorporate in the British Virgin Islands. Because if you want to find out the owner of a British Virgin Islands company, firstly, you have to get some information from the registry, which will tell you who incorporated the company. Then you have to go to the person who incorporated the company and find out from them who it was who incorporated the company. Normally you can do it, it's just difficult. It often takes, it, it takes you, you have to go to the BVI first, then you have to go to the country in which the corporate service provider was that incorporated the British Virgin Island company. There's a lot of Isle of Man companies as well, I don't know the number, but hundreds of thousands, and that's for the same reasons. Jersey, there's a little over 30,000 Jersey companies. The reason that there's 30,000 Jersey companies is the registrar knows who the beneficial owner of the company is. So you need a court order. If you can get a court order to get the company registry documents, then you will get it. And the, the point I'm making at this stage is there are differences between the offshore centres. They're very competitive and they're reacting to the international pressure that's being put on them in different ways. Some of them are really just a, a rush for cheap, cheap and cheerful, to do everything as cheaply as they can and as in a slipshod a fashion as they can. Others are taking things much more seriously and are trying to regulate properly, trying to move with international standards. And one of the questions I was asked is what the outlook is for offshore financial centres. Well, I think the outlook for those centres that have moved for cheap and cheerful and doing it for nothing is bleak. And you see Liechtenstein is probably the best example of that at the moment, where all of the bank records from the princely, court, princely um, bank were taken and now Liechtenstein facing massive uh, problems with, um, with the international community because it, it really didn't address issues such as tax evasion, such as um, corruption and the like. Other offshore centres, well, there may be quite a bit of time for them, I would have thought, um, as long as they apply proper international standards and seek to um, do what the, the international community wants. Well, enough, enough of generalisation about offshore centres. I'll do my best to, um, to answer any questions that you've got, but I make it plain. I'm not a tax lawyer. I'm not avoiding the. <laughs> I'm not evading or avoiding the issue, but I'm not a. I'm not a tax lawyer. I'm a courtroom lawyer. And what I thought I'd do, for the rest of the the time that I've got, is speak to you about three cases, about which I've had 
some personal experience, uh, tell you about them, and hopefully grounds for some optimism. Now, that means I want to go straight to the back of my uh, slides. Is, is this the thing? I'll flip through. There you go. There we go. This gentleman is called Philip de Figueiredo, and I'm a typical courtroom lawyer. I'm trained in the English system, so I'll act for anybody who pays me money, that's the gist of the um, that's the gist of the English <laughs> system. But I acted for this man for a short while before I got sacked, and I'm not allowed to tell you why, but I got sacked. <coughs> he um, is an accountant, and he's presently on bail in Queensland. And I don't imagine he wanted to go to Queensland very much because he's charged with fraud upon the. Australian revenue and he worked for a company called Strachan's SA, I think that's Society Anonyme or something like that, um, which was a, a company based in Switzerland. He's a Jerseyman, but Strachan's SA, the company, moved to Switzerland from Jersey and some say there may have been some connection between the introduction of money laundering laws in Jersey and the move, but I couldn't, couldn't possibly say. But they went to Switzerland and they sent faxes to Australia, they sent emails to Australia and various people visited Australia. And Strachan's was a, 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 com a trust and company service provider through an, account through an accountancy firm. Some of you may have heard of Operation Wickenby. I, I, don't, I don't know. It's a very high-profile Australian revenue investigation and it, run by the tax office, the federal police and the crime commission to identify taxpayers who have abused the tax system. And for reasons I don't fully understand, the Australians made clear several of, of the persons who were under investigation in this tax fraud and they included most famously Paul Crocodile Dundee Hogan who uh, pu publicly said something which sounds hugely fair which was he said that if I'm guilty of tax evasion so are several lawyers and accountants <laughs> and uh, I think his affairs were settled weren't they <laughs> with, the, with the revenue without the prosecution of any lawyers or any accountants well, this is similar to the UBS case that was being spoken to about yesterday, save that Strachan's SA, I think, were a lot less sophisticated than the Union Bank of Switzerland. They didn't, for instance, travel across borders with uh, encrypted laptops. In fact, quite the opposite, which is why I think the Australian Revenue knew uh, Mr. Hogan was uh, in, the, uh, in the investigation because a member of Strachan's travelled to Melbourne and he booked into the Four Seasons Hotel and he was, I'm told, in the presidential suite and he was there at a very unfortunate time because the Australian um, authorities had persuaded the Swiss authorities to search an office in Switzerland. And so one imagines that the telephone lines were ringing quite uh, frequently between Switzerland and, uh, and Australia. And you can imagine perhaps a, uh, a telephone conversation, something like this. You won't believe what's happened. They've come through the doors. They're looking at the records. What are, what are we going to do? And the uh, employee of Strachan's in the presidential suite in Melbourne is in Australia while the Australians are in Switzerland. You, you can sort of imagine what it must have been like as his blood ran cold. And uh, the Australians found out that he was in, in the hotel, and so they thought, well, we might as well go and arrest him while he's here. And there was a wonderful, there's a wonderful piece of evidence from a receptionist at the hotel in Melbourne which said, well, a call came through from Switzerland. I put it through to the room that Mr X was in upstairs. And it, I don't know how long it went on, but what I can tell you is that there was very shortly thereafter, there was a telephone call which said, can you send a shredder to the room? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know what he, I don't know what they were doing with the, with, with the shredder, but... <coughs> 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 
whatever he shredded, there was a, a laptop which wasn't encrypted, which gave the Australian Revenue an enormous amount of information about the, um, the, the Australians who were secreting their um, money through Strachan's in, um, <coughs> in Australia. And Mr. De Figueiredo has recently pleaded guilty in Australia to uh, tax evasion. And interestingly, one of the things that they were doing was the credit card trick that was being spoken about yesterday, where you give an Australian citizen a credit card, he can go and take money out of a hole in the wall, he can buy, for go he can buy goods in Australia, and the credit card being paid offshore, which seems an astonishingly unsophisticated way to try and um, defraud somebody in another country. And the idea that anybody ever thought you could travel to Australia and encourage Australian citizens to defraud the um, revenue of Australia and it not be a crime. It, it, it beggars belief. And it, picking up on what um, was said yesterday, what did the Union Bank of Switzerland bankers think when they went to the United States, falsely ticked the, um, the, 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 the boxes which immigration gave them as to what they were doing in the United States, so claiming they're on holiday, going in, meeting rich, rich Americans, telling them how to evade tax, and they go, oh, but, but it's not, a, not an offence in Switzerland. It, it, um, it beggars belief that anybody ever thought that. Um, and certainly that's, the UBS bankers have learned that. This is something which um, the, um, this Jersey account, he's a Jersey account running for, a, run out, run, running or working for um, Switzerland that he learned, and they, they ran, through the Jersey courts, this argument. But it's a tax offence. What's tax got to do? What's tax got to do with us? It's a principle of international law that you don't enforce other countries' tax bills, and that's that's still a general principle of, of most countries. You don't enforce another person's tax bills. And the Jersey court said, no, no, no. That's that might be right in terms of enforcing another country's tax bill but you still can't commit crimes against another country and just say, well, it's, it's only the revenue that, um, that, 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 that is the victim and therefore we won't do anything about it. And so if I said there's some, some optimism, well, there you are, that's an offshore centre extraditing a man to Australia for tax fraud. And I, I don't imagine many of you would have thought that an offshore lawyer would be coming in and telling you that that sort of thing is possible. And he, De Figueredo was extradited to Australia. Another accountant called Peter Michel was sentenced to six years uh, in prison in Jersey for laundering the proceeds of tax evasion from the UK. So a minor, a minor story, but a little bit of optimism. Somebody being prosecuted. And importantly, the message going out to other people in Jersey and actually other... Uh, what you would call traditional tax havens. Better be careful with this. You don't want to be serving six years imprisonment for laundering the proceeds of tax evasion, or you don't want to be put on a plane to Australia, or worse, the United States, for laundering the proceeds of tax evasion. So he's going to be sentenced in March 2013. There's, a, there's another point, isn't there, to this? You wouldn't really want to be an offshore accountant in front of a Queensland jury explaining how you've sent false invoices to be put before the, 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 the Australian revenue. I'm going to do the next, this case quite quickly because it's the last one I want to talk to you about a bit more. This is a, an Indian businessman called Raj Bojwani. And this, this is a, an astonishing story. Um, you probably won't believe me because I'm an offshore lawyer, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. Um, Raj Bajwani wanted to do... He's a very, very wealthy Indian businessman. He spends his time between India, Nigeria and London. And he, his main source of income was that he had the concession for Tata trucks in India. And he wanted to sell Tata trucks to Nigeria when General Abacho was president. He had a problem in that another country had the 
um, contract that he wanted, which was suppl to supply trucks to the Nigerian military. But he had a stroke of luck. Not many of us would call this a stroke of luck, but it was a stroke of luck to Bojwani because a bacha, you may remember, executed the poet Ken Sarawiva. And that, that appalled quite a lot of people. And very sanctions were put on Nigeria, and they were kicked out of the Commonwealth for a while. And that gave Bojwani the opportunity because the company that had the contract for the trucks was stuck with the sanctions. So he went to um, talk to Abacha's finance minister, a man called Arnie. And you've, if you, you've all entered contracts before, haven't you? Everybody here has entered contracts. You buy a house or um, um, get on your, on, your, on your bus ticket, that's a, con that's a contract. Well, this contract went something like this. Mr. Bojwani, I'd like to sell you some trucks, the finance minister. How many do you want to sell? Well, how many do you want? Well, we could probably do with X total. How much... Uh, uh, Bajwani... Sorry, Finance Minister. How much will that cost? Bajwani, $75 million. Fi Finance Minister, no it won't. It'll cost $150 million. <laughs> so a well-known method of negotiation between at arm's length. <coughs> so... Bojwani says, yeah, all right, fine, great, 150, I'd have settled for 75, but 150 sounds good. I'm, the number's about right, I'm not making this up, the number's about right. Arnie then says, about that $75 million excess. <coughs> and he says, that's got to go via, via a circuitous route to two Swiss bank accounts. And... The Swiss bank accounts are called Kaiser and Sosa. Any of you Hollywood fans? Yeah. The usual suspects, Kevin Spacey, Kaiser Sosa, who turns out, is he Satan? Is not the suggestion that this evil character, I promise you, I promise you this is true, two coded Swiss bank accounts called Kaiser and Sosa. So he sends the trucks to Nigeria, $150 million comes, I think, through London and then into a Jersey bank account, and where from where immediately $75 million goes in split in half, half to Kaiser, half to Soiza. Those are coded accounts for the um, a batch, two of a batch's children, his, his sons. Everyone's happy. How could anybody un be unhappy? A batch's kids are happy. The Nigerian military have got $75 million worth of trucks. Bajwani's got his profits. What could be, what could be wrong with the world? <laughs> well, Abacha, Abacha died, and I know that, I guess Tim Daniel spoke about Abacha a couple of days ago, did he? I would imagine. Did he, did he tell you the story about how Abacha died? <laughs> uh, he's a very, very pucker English lawyer. He wouldn't tell you this. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, story that Abacha, there's a story that General Abacha was killed by Mossad. I've never, under, I've never understood that. I, I don't know what he did to the Israelis in particular. But my favourite story is that he died of an overdose of Viagra. <laughs> Entertaining uh, ladies of the night, which um, I think, well, at least he got some pleasure out of life. It's a good thing. <coughs> anyway, Abacha died. A government, a government passed. And then another government came in, which very rarely had the political will to go after the Abachas. And various journalists got in, interested in the, um, in the case. And the Financial Times ran a whole page, full, full, full scat page of um, allegations about General Abacha. And they named the accounts Kaiser and Soiza. And one could imagine Mr. Bojwani getting a bit nervous as he saw this, read the Financial Times, saw Kaiser and Soiza. And he rang the bank in Jersey, and nobody knows what the discussion was between him and the banker who answered the phone, because nobody can remember who answered the phone and the like. But effectively what he did was clear out the bank account. There was $45 million left in the bank account, and they had a banker's draft for $45 million made out to bearer. 
which, <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine if the, that had fallen in the wrong hands? But anyway, they couldn't, they couldn't deposit it anywhere. Nobody would accept a $45 million bank's draft, strangely, made out to bearer. <laughs> but they put it back into accounts in companies c completely unconnected with the one that, the, that it had come out from, and then invested it in Indian Millennium deposits, something I'd never heard of until the time until we had to look at this. But this was uncovered. Jersey investigated it, the offshore islands, very strange. And they decided they were going to prosecute Mr. Bojwani. But Mr. Bojwani has never been to Jersey. Um, he flits between London and Nigeria and India. And by coincidence, they found out that he was on a plane traveling through London from Geneva to Chicago. So he's nabbed on the plane, arrested on the plane at Heathrow, sent to Jersey and tried, and f f ran every argument under the sun. He did everything he could to have this um, case dismissed. Weeks before the trial, the Nigerian Attorney General wrote and demanded the evidence back from the Jersey authorities. The Nigerians were brilliant. They provided the contract documents, they provided witnesses, they fully cooperated. But weeks before the trial, um, or months before the trial, asked for the documents back. Anybody got any guess as to how that was dealt with? They kept copies and sent the documents back and prosecuted him on the copies. But um, he, he was sentenced, I think he got six years, six years imprisonment and 26 million pounds confiscated from him and repatriated to Nigeria. So some grounds for optimism, misuse of offshore services, misuse of banking facilities, but some responsibility taken and a prosecution, and Mr. Bojwani, having never been in Jersey, spending some time in one of its, well, its only facility. And the last case I'm going to talk about is um, Paolo Malouf. And um, I think I was in lots of trouble because I sent my slides to the organizers so late. But this was because I was waiting for um, a judgment in this case before I sent my slides, and the judgment came in last Friday. And Paolo Malouf is a very wealthy South American businessman. He's, he was the mayor of Sao Paulo. Um, and this he, he's facing trial in Brazil for an enormous fraud, where the totals are <coughs> believe the Brazilians are asking for, with penalties, repayment of 1.5 billion US dollars. He is also wanted in New York, for reasons I'll explain to you, for money laundering through New York. And there was a trial in Jersey which ended last week with the judgment last week, with him ordered to pay back 10.5 million dollars, which he stole in five weeks, which I'll tell you about which are expecting to go up to it's about $36 million with, comp with compound interest. Well, how did this case end up to be tried on a little offshore island? Well, Malouf was mayor of Sao Paulo for the second time in the mid-1990s, and he came out of power in, I think, it's about 1996. And... I had the good fortune of acting, acting for Brazil in this case. He came out of power in 1996, and he built, or the, rather the municipality of Sao Paulo built while he was mayor, um, a motorway, a highway through the middle of Sao Paulo called the Avenue Aspreda. And it was alleged that he, the company, it was alleged that the company that did the work, the engineering company, over invoiced by some 90 percent so a check would be made out to the construction company and it would be in a very very large sum immediately the head contractor would make out checks totaling 90 percent to subcontractors and pay it down to subcontractors 
they had access to the subcontractors' checkbooks and made out, then made out checks with, we don't know exactly how this happened, but we had some of the checks, some of them to cash, some of them just blank, to a total of 90% again. So, sorry, they, that's right, they paid 100% down to the, um, of what was owed to the subcontractors on invoices. Then 90% came back in on false checks. In Brazil, they have a secondary market for foreign exchange through people called Dolieros, unlicensed foreign exchange brokers. And those checks were deposited amongst a range of unlicensed foreign exchange dealers. You could never, you could never track that. It's just, that's impossible to track effectively, it's gone. But what happened was that once you paid that money to people in Brazil, they hold accounts in the United States in US dollars from which they can pay dollars. It's quite complicated. No, no Brazilian currency moves from Brazil to the United States. There's no cross-border movement. The real stay in Brazil, but the dollar, the dealer, has bank accounts in the US with dollars in, so there's complete disconnect between Brazil and the United States. But money was paid into a bank account called Chinani in New York, in a bank in New York, and that account could be tied to Malouf in various ways. One of the ways was he paid one of his bills at Sotheby's, the auction house, from that account, and we, we got hold of Malouf's Sotheby's account, which you would have loved to have seen. It was fantastic. If you, if you can imagine a man more corrupt than this man, I can't imagine looking at his Renoirs and his Magritte's and his <laughs> anything he wanted, this man could have. So powerful. And the money then went from the accounts in New York to bank accounts in company's names in Jersey, then to another company's name in Jersey, and then it went through a unit trust, about which I could talk for a long time, and was invested back into Brazil. So the money was stolen from the Brazilian taxpayer, and then through the use of offshore accounts, including offshore New York, into Jersey, into a unit trust, back into Brazil. How could they tie it to Malouf, you might say? Well, there's one astonishing document in the case, because the fraud was so big, you couldn't possibly keep it in your head. There was too much dishonesty going on. There needed to be some records, and somebody an anonymously posted to the uh, prosecutor in Brazil a series of documents. And one of the documents, I mean, the, the prosecutor's looking at them going, what, a, what on earth are these documents? But they worked out that at the top of the document were payments from the municipality of Sao Paulo to the contractor. And then there were some deductions for tax. And then there was a sum which said, some owing, some owed. And then there was a series of payments in reals, was I think 15 payments in reals down the left-hand column of a page, a US dollar conversion rate, and then a series of 15 US dollar numbers. And of the 15 US dollar numbers, 13 of them matched exactly the deposits in the New York bank account that I've told you about. So they went, what on earth? What, why would there be the sheet of paper with 13 payments on it in dollars matching deposits into a New York bank account? What's that all about? And then they looked at the top of the document and they worked out, quite complicated calculations, that that represented to the penny what was paid from the municipality of Sao Paulo to the contractor. And then they worked out that the sum that went into the New York bank account was exactly 20% of the payments from the municipality to the contractor. And the, the case really was presented on that can't be, nobody could have made that up, that can't be a forgery. It's just too unbelievably coincidental to be anything other than true. But what, 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 could you, uh, what can you learn from this? How did Brazil work out that 
what the numbers on the right hand side meant the numbers to the how, how did New York get in touch with Brazil and how did Jersey get in touch with how did it all get put together well it's a good example of the money laundering laws working properly and investigations in different jurisdictions actually working with each other asking each other questions because there was a Jersey investigation because Malouf had a lot of money in Jersey. Why would a, 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 a Brazilian politician have a lot of money in Jersey? Look, all of this money's come from uh, New York. Well, we'll ask the New York um, Attorney General, can you find out what this is about? He finds out what this is about. And then Brazil get put in touch with the United States, getting put in touch with Jersey. And together, countries taking responsibility for their financial problems and their woes, there's a result. How many of these cases do we get a year? When was the last case that you can remember that actually went to trial and there was a, and there was a verdict or when there was, there was a judgment? Anybody with the, since the Lesotho one, when, anybody got another one to name? Bit miserable, isn't it? Bit miserable. They're very, very rare that, these thing, that there are judgments in these things. But I suppose my optimistic message, well, it's happened here, so maybe it can happen again if those people who think in the right way work together properly. Is that right? Yeah. yeah thank you. <coughs> okay. The theme for the last two presentations are the, the really the big players uh, in the financial industry, the auditing firms, the big four, and the banks. So uh, this is going to be very exciting. And as a journalist, I have to say I love this, the title of this uh, presentation. <laughs> the pinstripe mafia, how accountancy firms destroy societies. That's a good headline. Uh, the presenter is uh, Mr. Prem Sika. Uh, he is a professor of accounting at the University of Essex. Uh, his research on accountancy, auditing, tax avoidance, tax havens, Corporate Governance, Money Laundering, Insolvency and Business Affairs has been published in books, international uh, journals, newspapers and magazines. And he will talk about the role of accountancy firms in tax avoidance, secrecy and design of tax avoidance schemes and the global tax avoidance industry. The floor is yours, Mr. Ziga. Thank you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon and uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organisers of this uh, uh, conference for this wonderful opportunity to not only renew some old friendships but also hopefully make some new friends too on this very long uh, journey. Please have a look at the AABA website, I'm Ms. Director. We were the first creators of the country by country accounting standard which my friend Richard Murphy wrote for us way back in 2003. And there is nothing whatsoever to prevent any of us from developing a complete suite of alternative accounting standards. That was our aim at that time, but regrettably there are never enough hours of the day. So if you'd like to help, we can completely develop an alternative set of accounting standards and see. So I'm going to talk about obviously accountancy firms. Accountants, uh, accountants are very important, as all of you know. So important uh, that they argued amongst themselves about who was really more important, an accountant, a surgeon or an engineer. They, they could not resolve the dispute. So being an accountant has its privileges, so they got access to God and said, okay, God would adjudicate. Well, tell us who's more important. Is it a surgeon? Is it uh, an engineer? Is it an accountant? So it was first the... Uh, engineer's turn and he said, oh Lord, we are more important. You made the heavens and the planets, they go round and round and they work in perfect harmony, everything is in balance, and we're just doing your work in this world, that's what we do. We make machines and things, they go round and round and they work and that is all there is to it. You know, we are just doing your work. Surgeon said, no, rubbish. He said, look, you made Adam and then you took his rib and made Eve and we've been doing body surgery ever since. <laughs> we, are, we are really the more important. We are just doing your work. Without us, there'd be nothing but chaos. And accountant said, chaos? Who do you think is responsible for that then? <laughs> and uh, 
And uh, so now we come to uh, look at the world of accountants. This pinstripe mafia is kind of an allusion to sharp suits worn by city gents in the city of London. And we have a new mafia in town. It does not actually shoot people, it does not put bullets in their kneecaps, but its trade is just as deadly. It deprives people of opportunities to have health care, education, security, justice, and essentially a fulfilling life. Just like the mafia collects its toll from every street, so do these accountancy firms. Their toll, the toll of tax avoidance, is paid by every citizen in every street. Everyone pays for it. Just like the mafia has penetrated the state, accountancy firms have also penetrated the state. Indeed, their rise as tax advisors is based upon a state-guaranteed monopoly, state-guaranteed market of external audit, which is reserved for accountants. Nobody else can do this. The law does not force the sick to consult a doctor or the injured to consult a lawyer, but the law forces certain types of businesses to have an audit. That gives you income. That gives you access to top management. That makes you part of the way capitalism works, or does not work as the case may be. So accountants enjoy these kind of privileges. And uh, the pinstripe mafia is not based in, uh, uh, if I get this thing right, it is not uh, based in some offshore place, but it has grown up in uh, generally the first world capitals, as Jim Henry whose excellent work, The Price of Offshore Revisited, reminds us, it is in places like New York, London, Geneva, Frankfurt, Singapore. It is surrounded by complete secrecy. And more on that as I uh, go along. And legislators are well aware. And here's a speech given by a legislator in the UK, UK House of Lords. Of course, I've not added that he, he is an AABA member. Nobody knows, but now you know. Uh, and he says there are armies of bankers, lawyers, and accountants who ensure that even though the letter of the law is respected, increasingly immoral ways are found of perverting the spirit of the law to ensure that tax is avoided. To hide its true purpose, the tax avoidance industry adopts the language of real business. So, so, so that is the way they basically play their game. And uh, then he goes on to explain a few details. But uh, people are immediately disarmed about looking at accountants, so accounting is boring, it's technical, it's grey, you won't understand it. That means the legislators, researchers, journalists are all immediately disarmed. But actually accounting is affecting people's life chances. That is what accountants are doing. It is subverting democracy. We can all elect a government which says, vote for us, we will give you better health care, better education, better security and next day accountants say sorry about that folks you elected this government but we actually got a tax avoidance scheme and the Amazons and the Googles and Microsofts won't be paying any taxes in your jurisdiction too bad you voted for it but actually you're gonna get something else which you haven't really voted for so there's a real challenge to democracy itself okay so let's look at who these big players are this, these are the four accounting firms which are the epicenter of global tax avoidance industry. PricewaterhouseCoopers, who often will lowball audits, and sometimes I call them half price waterhouse because the lowball audits to sell, sell consultancy on its back. You got Deloitte and Touche, Ernst and Young, KPMG, the firm which was private advisor to, gov uh, to Colonel Gaddafi, managed his wealth. We heard earlier on about how we go after these kind of people, but nobody's gone after KPMG to say, well, how on earth were you advising Colonel Gaddafi and his family to manage his wealth, uh, sitting in London and New York? So the combined income of these firms is about $110 billion, which makes them about the world's 55th or 56th biggest economy. They have more resources than many of the governments, or many nation states on this planet. They have plenty of financial and political resources. In the US, they back the Republican candidate and the, presidential, uh, the Democratic candidate for presidency for equal amounts. They hedged their bets. In the UK, they did the same, uh, though they gave more to the Conservative Party. They provide jobs for former and potential ministers. So accompanying these set of slides is a monograph 
which is called the Pinstripe Mafia. That would be, should be on his website, on the conference website fairly soon. That gives you all the details. It's about 22,000 words long. You can read lots of background information. So I'm just going to quickly go through it. The monograph also covers the role of the firms in bribery, corruption, and running cartels, and money laundering too. Okay, so I'm only going to talk a little bit about tax here. So I've been looking at these firms for a long time. I've been doing accounting work for 44 years. I started looking at them about 20 BC. BC is before color television, about 20 years before color television. <laughs> okay, so, so that's how long I've been looking at them. And uh, you will see. So they have a vast amount of political resource. Ernst and Young hope that by 2015 they will have 215,000 employees worldwide. There are about 2.5 million professionally qualified accountants on this planet. About 330,000 are in the UK. So Napoleon, who said England was a nation of shopkeepers, got it wrong. It's a nation of accountants, actually. <laughs> and uh, bright young things don't dream of becoming an astronaut or a real engineer or even a train driver. It's how can I do financial engineering. Financial engineering is not taught at universities. It is learnt within these firms. If you join as a tax advisor, the very first training session would be how to create a structure which nobody can easily penetrate or investigate. That is playing off one jurisdiction against another, as we heard. That is the first training session at, in the tax workshops in, the, in the, these firms. So, so there are you know, lots of... Uh, uh, th things going on. These accounting firms also control the setting of accounting standards. They provide one and a half million dollars each year to the International Accounting Standards Board and not surprising as we were developing the country by country ac accounting standard, the ISB didn't want to talk to us. They know what we are trying to do. And same in the UK, the Accounting Standards Board said, you are lobbying, we don't want to talk to you. Or, what do you think the others do? <laughs> And uh, so there were ways had to be found around of uh, uh, dealing uh, with them. So they control too many things. Okay, the head of anti-avoidance in the UK uh, t tax authority uh, is from one of these firms. The newly appointed chairman of Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, which is a tax authority, is a partner from KPMG. Their partners have penetrated the state. They are running the treasury. And I'll give you some examples of one of the, some things they come up with. So what do we know about these firms? Despite enjoying a state guaranteed market of external audit, the firms are hardly required to publish any worthwhile information about themselves. We don't even know how they are controlled. So Jack would remember this uh, when Senator John Kerry investigated BCCI. Uh, in the early 1990s, a bank which collapsed uh, under the weight of fraud, they subpoenaed Price Waterhouse New York, said, OK, we've got to have a look at your uh, working papers. Uh, after all, you have a common worldwide name, a common worldwide logo, a website, a common board of directors. You must be the same organization because, after all, when you pitch for audit, you say you're a global organization. But the New York office said, actually, we are not the same. We are actually a collection of national organizations. We are not really global at all, though they say they are global. Well, OK, the London office was approached and said, well, would you like to cooperate? They said, not really. Why not? Well, actually, we are not really in London. Well, where are you? Well, actually, we are controlled by PwC Worldwide, which is in Bermuda. And Bermuda doesn't have any information sharing treaties with you lot, so off you go. Nobody cooperated. That episode repeat, repeated a number of times, though it may have changed now because of the new uh, regulations in the US, but we have to wait and see. So we know very little about these organizations. How much money do they make out of tax avoidance? We don't know. How many tax avoidance schemes do they sell? We know a little bit about them, but not a lot. Again, we would see. So these firms operate from places, so they have more offices than Coca-Cola. They operate from more cities than Coca-Cola, okay? As the previous slide uh, gives you some number of offices. 
They have about 80 offices that we can locate in offshore tax havens, which generally do not levy any corporation tax, income tax, don't require companies to file accounts, no audit, but there is an office of a big four. As many offices as you will find for McDonald's in these places, really. Okay? And they have work, obviously, in collaboration with banks and law firms. And they have a very elaborate organizational structure to manufacture tax avoidance schemes. That is what the bright young things are paid to do. And as I said, they have basically captured the state, certainly. So here is a statement from uh, Senator Carl Levin's committee. He's saying accountancy firms have moved from providing one-to-one -one tax advice in relation to tax inquiries to initiating, designing, mass marketing tax shelter products. Dubious tax shelter sales are no longer the province of shady fly-by-night companies. They are big business assigned to talented professions, generally in the country's largest accounting firms. So this idea that we're only responding to the client's needs, that era has long vanished. Within accounting firms, tax departments are profit centers. They are assigned targets to generate revenues and profits. You generate them by dreaming up schemes, and you go to sell it to the clients. People are trained in sales patter, psychological warfare, phoning up a client and saying, by the way, this scheme, if you don't buy today, next week, it's not going to be available. Quick, sign up today. And if somebody is not persuaded, you phone again and say, your rival has bought uh, this scheme, and their profits are going to increase by so much. You're going to be left behind. So all sorts of sales techniques are developed, very psychological. This is trained, experienced professionals engaging in this. So accountancy firms have no regard for the public interest. <coughs> accountancy firms also have a very nasty history, if you look at them. For example, they appeased the Nazis just before the Second World War. A delegation led by Deloitte went to Germany, thought it was a good business opportunity. They were at the forefront of apartheid, operating that in South Africa. Even post-independent West Indies, they were at the forefront of racial discrimination, saying, sure, you can become an accountant with us. We train you, no problem. First, you go and be educated in London. Of course, uh, people couldn't afford to do that, and therefore, very few blacks got into uh, big accountancy firms. And if you look at the history, the kind of things they have opposed in the UK, publication of the profit and loss account, balance sheet, audit report, group accounts, revelation of turnover, publication of audit fee, non-audit fee, you name it, they have opposed it. People think these are the guardians of somehow transparency and public accountability. They have never been. I don't know where this image has ever come from. Anyone studying accounting history can see it. It's just imaginary, okay? So these firms, basically have no regard for the public interest. Their activities transfer wealth, generally from ordinary citizens to a few elites, generally to uh, capital, and uh, uh, they have to create a demand for their products. And that is what exactly they do, and that is what we have to look at. And they basically sell the idea that Tax avoidance is cost minimization. If we are going to succeed in challenging this industry, we have to challenge their language, their vocabulary. Tax is not a cost. Cost in economic theory relates to a factor of production. Tax has never been a factor of production. <coughs> tax is simply an allocation of revenue. We can challenge it with, with an alternative formulation of ideas. We can say, look, if you're going to generate wealth, it re requires cooperation. Those who provide finance get a return called dividend. Those who invest human capital are entitled to wages. And then society provides social capital, education, health care, and its return is tax. But accountants have found a way, with the silence of the political institutions, to basically capture, collar, aim, subvert what is due to society. And they are saying it is a cost. It has never been a cost. There's no economic theory which backs it up as a cost that I know of. And if there are any economists here, I'm happy to argue the case with them. So in economics, anything 
which relates to a factor of production, could be a cost in accounting. Anything that gets in the way of the expansion of capital is a cost. Workers get in the way, state gets in the way, it is a cost. Cost means it's a burden. It must be eliminated, it must be reduced. So look at the whole language of accounting. It is a cost, it is a burden. We must not use that kind of language. We have to develop alternative language, alternative visions, alternative ways. That is a way of challenging uh, these people. So the basic organizational culture of neoliberalism, expanded by accountancy firms who are simultaneously the beneficiaries as well as the architects of this culture, is that bending the rules to make profits at almost any cost is now considered to be an entrepreneurial skill. The closer, you, the closer you sail to the wind, somehow you're smarter and you're a media star and you're in demand. And their ideology, this is a quote from a partner, a firm like ours is a commercial organization. The bottom line is that the individual must contribute to the profitability of the business. Essentially, profitability is based upon the ability to serve existing clients well. No mention of society, no public interest. Uh, when I argue this with a Price Waterhouse partner in a face-to-face -face debate, there was about a couple of hundred people present, uh, the, his conclusion at the end was to go for me right at the end, when we had to sum it up, he said, Professor Sicker, you never give us credit for anything, we generate millions of dollars of revenues, and we have lots and lots of satisfied clients, what is your problem? And my response was very simple, that's the language of drug pushers and pimps. Loss of satisfied <laughs> clients and uh, loss of money, okay? That's no defense at all. The question is, what are you doing that's socially desirable? Anybody can make money and produce a satisfied client, okay? So, that's, uh, so that is that. So the emphasis basically is on being commercial and performing a service for the customer. That is what people are trained into in accountancy firms. That is what the whole emphasis is. So Christian Aid basically reminding, if, uh, people here from Christian Aid, even though I had an input to this, uh, basically saying that these big firms are exploiting and uh, basically generating misery and poverty. In the UK and US there's a requirement to register tax avoidance schemes and later on you will see KPMG deliberately decided to ignore it. In the UK, they have a law since 2004 called the Disclosure of Tax Avoidance Schemes, DOTAS, and they are required to file the registration schemes before they market them, but there are lots of ifs and buts, and the law does not fully work as it should, but nevertheless, that is a development. We don't know how much money the countries are losing. The UK could be between 35 and 150 billion, European Union a trillion dollars, due to tax avoidance and evasion. That's based on an EU press release, not on any economic model. The US Treasury claims anywhere between 345 billion, 500 billion, that's the tax gap, made of tax arrears, tax avoidance, tax evasion, combination of these things. Could be bigger because we keep wondering about what transfer pricing is doing and many other things are doing. So difficult to know. But these are the kind of ballpark figures. Developing countries could be up to $500 billion a year. The total foreign aid is about $120 billion. So it's a lot of money. Whole variety of te techniques, many which we heard already. So there's a problem about what do we do about this? What can the law do? Anything that the law introduces, well, within the next few hours, uh, the bright young graduates undo it. And that remains a constant uh, challenge. I'm not aware of any academic and universities teaching students on how to develop tax avoidance schemes. It must be learnt within generally the firms. That is where it is uh, learned. In the UK, every year there is a finance bill. About 30 to 40 percent of this deals with so-called tax loopholes or tax avoidance schemes, and our legislation keeps getting longer and longer, bigger and bigger, for the, that one reason. Okay. There are about 22,100 tax disputes waiting to be heard by the courts in the UK. Think of the enormous public expenditure. Okay. And the tax authorities, according to a report yesterday, are investigating about 41,000 other cases adding up to about 10 billion pound of tax. 
So, problem. So these schemes masquerade as tax avoidance, but often go to the courts, and the courts declare them unlawful, means they are basically evasion. Okay? But many schemes simply don't get uh, challenged. So there's huge public expenditure, and the UK government has never ever recovered the cost of litigation from the promoters of the scheme. So that means the taxpayer bears the cost. The promoters are not fined. What have they got to lose? Often there are contingency fees that will contribute towards a court case uh, if, a, if, a, if a client is sued by the tax authorities or they reject something. That, again, seems odd. That is how it works. Well, here we are. KPMG are the auditors of some of the companies who have been in the headlines about uh, tax avoidance, but we don't find anything in the accounts about how the companies got to that position. What exactly were the auditors looking? Were they not put upon inquiry when the tax bill did not look reasonable? There's a professional principle of being put upon inquiry. Now, nothing doing there. WorldCom had this wonderful asset called Management Foresight, which, what is it? Well, it just means that you can uh, sell things in different packages. I can sell you mobile phone and on its own. I can sell you mobile phone and television. I can sell you a mobile phone and broadband and other things with bells and whistles added. I can put a different logo on it. I can sell you something with the Mickey Mouse cartoon on it, anything you want. It's called management foresight. Now, the management foresight then is uh, created in a company in Delaware. The, then the company receives royal sold to all the other subsidiaries, and they all pay royalties. So KPMG <laughs> dreamt up that scheme. If you picked up any accounting book, you will never find an asset called management foresight. But it was a nice way of creaming off uh, 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 the revenue. In some countries, it wiped up 80 to 90 percent of the revenue, never mind the profit. Com profit is completely sucked out. Has this kind of practice disappeared? No. Last week in the UK, there was a case involving Ernst & Young scheme, which is for a newspaper. And basically, the newspaper masked heads. So when you look at a newspaper, at the top, sometimes there are advertisements. They decided that is an asset. So there is a company which suddenly is making profit. And the company is now worried that the trade unions uh, might demand a higher wages for workers. So the question is, how do you make the profit vanish? The answer is, well, you treat mastheads as an asset. You sell that to a company within a, uh, to, uh, to a parent company, if you like. Then the parent company licenses it back to the subsidiaries. The subsidiaries pay a rent, and the profit is wiped out. So earlier we heard about transparency, so I thought I'd quote you about from an email in relation to this case. Uh, as it came out, the company director, finance director, counted Ernst & Young out of the blue. He said, this is a problem we have, this is what we want to do. And eventually the reply was, uh, for a fee we can significantly lessen the transparency of reported results. So much for transparency and what accountants will. For a fee, we can le you know, significantly lessen the transparency of reported results. So in this case, there were some 5.6 million uh, pound of uh, tax reliefs were at stake. That basically, you can, you can work out for yourself how many people could have a cataract operation and how many people with that can have a, a hip a, a, a replacement. There was another Ernst & Young scheme relating to a pub called Green King. Basically, there is a loan of 300 million pounds, and eventually the issue is uh, how do you arrange it in such a way that somebody can actually get relief on the interest? Well, the, actually, the loan is within the group. There is no real cash going out of the group. And eventually, that is thrown out by the courts, too. So the idea that the firms go to register tax schemes has not stopped them from marketing them. And it is resulting in a lot of uh, costs for, the, uh, 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 for everybody else uh, involved. So about half, it is estimated by the tax authorities that about <coughs> half of the tax income of accountancy firms comes from tax avoidance schemes, and they may be responsible for about half of the uh, tax avoidance schemes uh, 
uh, in the UK as well, but we have to learn more about them. So here is, uh, this is all based on actual things filed with the courts. So a case of Jason Drummond, the millionaire, that basically designed a scheme so that he would not have to pay income tax on uh, his wealth and uh, basically creating losses. Again, the case of a, a timber company and a computer supplies helping them to avoid tax. I like this one, which is in the Channel Islands. RAL is an amusement arcade. These people come and put a coin in the slot and uh, hope to win something. And completely out of the blue, they never had any contact with KPMG. Somebody phones and said, we've been looking at your accounts. You realize you could improve your profit by about four million pounds a year without doing anything. How do you do this? Well, we have a scheme. Okay, so like in the US KPMG cases, they came and made a presentation. No document is left behind. Doc presentations are made on flip charts. No trace is left behind of any kind and basically meant uh, that serious a company that set up in the Channel Islands who would now own the amusement arcades in England, 127 of them. So nothing changes about the amusement arcades. Because Channel Island had a special VAT arrangement with the European Union, okay, uh, basically companies based in the Channel Island can trade in other countries but they were not subject to the VAT. So basically the idea was every pound you put into the slot 20% of that should be oh, sales tax, roughly. But that sales tax would not be, they said, payable to the government. But you would be able to, play, uh, to reclaim the tax you have suffered on your purchases. That was the kind of scheme. So complete cold calling. Wasn't any, anybody demanded anything. And they basically dreamt up this thing, looking at the cracks in the European law. And the scheme was thrown out. So KPMG's rotten organizational culture was exposed by the US Senate hearings, 500 tax avoidance schemes on the shelf, and they had decided in writing internally that they were not going to comply with the US laws. They worked out that the profits were much bigger than even if they are caught and the fines they got to pay. And some of those documents are reproduced in the monograph, which would be on the website afterwards, and you can have a look. So they actually sat down and did this cost-benefit analysis. Okay, that's as far, how far they go to work out. No regard for any of the consequences. The firm eventually paid $456 million fine. Some of their partners went to prison, been fined too, but hasn't stopped them. Maybe made them a little bit more careful, but hasn't stopped them. Ernst & Young, been very famous. There's a well-known mobile phone company, Phones For You. Its directors for years and years did not pay themselves in cash. They paid themselves in gold bars, fine wine, perfume, and platinum sponge. And thus avoided uh, taxes. All the government had to do was change the law, and they did. As soon as they did that, Ernst & Young dreamt up another scheme whereby the directors could basically get back to the same position, but paying them through offshore trusts. Here is another one. You look at the names they designed for the schemes. So, okay, internally it was called PETA, which stands for <coughs> pain somewhere. Okay, and it was sold to about 70 major retailers, and again exploiting the kind of uh, VAT. So basically you pay a hundred pound on a credit card and they were going to say 2.5% of this is service charge. You actually still pay a hundred, whether you pay by cash or by credit card. But they were going to say this 2.5 is actually a service charge and therefore kind of exempt from VAT and therefore you haven't got to pay the VAT over to the tax authorities and you keep it for yourself. So that is the scheme they uh, dreamt up. There are many others too. Again, a number of Ernst & Young partners have also been uh, prosecuted, been fined, gone to prison, but no action against the firm. KPMG, despite admitting criminal wrongdoing, was allowed to continue in business. It's got friends in high places, and that uh, continued, uh, that, that helped them out. So no end to tax avoidance, and they basically continue. PricewaterhouseCoopers is advising Jamaica on how to become a tax haven. Okay, so more tax havens will emerge. 
and uh, their partner was the president of the local institute of chartered accountants again they've been under the radar of the u.s uh, permanent uh, u.s senate uh, permanent subcommittee on investigations radar they played the game on patent donations in the u.s to come up with the idea that you could donate old patents to universities and not for profit organizations what happened suddenly the old worthless patents appear in balance sheets at very very high figures so that you could claim a higher tax write-off so again uh, that that game they kind of played and uh, again other sort of cases uh, too in the u.s i'm running out of time so and a judge in the u.s case said that pw scheme was a sham and he threw it out but still continues in the, US, the UK fairly recent case of Schofield versus Schofield versus Revenue, a taxpayer sold a business for profit of 10 million, PwC charged 200,000, and basically went around, lost a circular transaction simply to create a loss. Against, again, a judge threw it out. So I'm referring to documents which are publicly available. We don't know what else does not come to the public kind of attention. Here is a wonderful Invention in creative accounting, Sab Miller, group revenues, 26 billion, pre-tax profits, just under 3 billion, and they say they paid a total tax of 7 billion. How could that be? Okay, uh, tell you in a moment, ExxonMobil took out ads in a paper, taxes, 99 billion, and uh, they said they paid on profits of 36 billion. How could that be? Price Waterhouse Coopers come up with this thing called total tax contribution so they're adding everything that the business collects value added tax sales tax what employees pay in income tax everything is added up and said, so look at our tax contribution and in that we only have one question could you please tell us what these companies paid in each country no that information they can't tell us so they market this and this is published every year for major companies Okay, this is their response to the public anger on tax avoidance to say, look how much we are actually paying. So this is kind of uh, looking at that. Okay, so the large companies in the U.S. Uh, and in U.K. are basically opting out of taxes, <coughs> and this is their response. So the total tax contribution is a man who invented it. The partner is, uh, is uh, well connected with the U.K. Treasury you will find the details in the monograph. So these are the people who are working for the state. So Deloitte and Touche became famous through uh, the Enron schemes, which are still being unraveled, as far as I understand, by the IRS. Uh, there was a 2,300-page publication, which was an introduction to tax avoidance schemes by Enron. They're still looking at it. So Deloitte's were part of the designers. Uh, of that and back home the Royal Bank of Scotland bailed out by the taxpayers is also implicated in tax avoidance schemes designed by uh, Deloitte's so despite a lot of public exposure these firms are not really put off from designing uh, tax avoidance schemes it just continues because it is part of their trade and we have to challenge it so Vodafone's been under in the news MG Rover Deutsche Bank don't, didn't want to pay t income taxes on the bankers' bonuses. So bankers are happy to be rescued, but actually don't want to pay the income taxes, and D Deloitte stepped forward and designed a scheme. Pay them through offshore. Glencore has been in the news. Glo global witness people would tell us more about this. And so it basically goes on everywhere. So major firms are not what they claim to be. They don't serve the public interest, they don't serve the social interest, they are not very transparent about anything they do, they are not accountable. Okay, so we have to ask some big questions about them. Their culture is to make money, fines and prisons are just another business cost, which you have to factor into it. It does not stop the business, it's just something you've got to take into account. Okay, that is entrepreneurial capitalism. Lots of graduates work for them. And basically they are busy damaging the citizens' right to decent public goods, supply of public goods and life, and they are also damaging democracy. So we need to investigate this pinstripe mafia, 
At the very minimum, there should be no public contract for anybody selling tax avoidance schemes. That includes accountancy firms, but they get a large amount of uh, revenues from the state. Maybe we should be licensing tax advisors and those whose schemes are thrown out by the court then lose their license. They can't practice. They can't earn a living. But at the moment, that does not happen in the UK. Why give their partners the benefit of limited liability when they are damaging the society? Say, so, right, sorry, no limited liability of any kind for you. Go back to the old-fashioned partnerships rather than the limited liability partnerships. Make them disclose the money they make from tax avoidance schemes. Find them. Make their files available to the tax authorities straight away so that people can see rather than years and years of protracted uh, litigation. Point made earlier about the corporations of uh, the uh, tax returns of all corporations also to be made uh, publicly available. <coughs> but I'll leave you with this thought. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, I think we, we could have a question or two. Thank you. Um, from the audience, state your name, please. Thank you. My name is uh, Ulusha Gunrutimi, uh, also a fellow of an institute of chartered accountants. And I thought we could clearly see a line here that these audit firms, it is not their duty to prepare the accounts. As a matter of fact, by law, the board of directors are responsible for the accounts. Number two, it is the responsibility of the tax revenue not to take ordinary paper. Because in Nigeria, we have had issues to put audit fair on the lock. Now, these entities, big entities, is there nothing to pinpoint one or two of them? You can lock up the firm name because it's a partnership business. I have a firm. But what the law recognizes me and my certificate, not the name of the firm. It's not a public quoted company. So if we are talking of the lot, we are just talking of name. Mm -hmm. we are I mean, the law is looking at the people behind it. So the partners, the managing partners, the senior partners, those are the people the Lord should put in prison. If they do a lot of that, then people will learn to do business in the right way. And I think instead of you emphasizing the name, the Lord, uh, Pete Mewick, let's look at the culprits. Because if you don't look at the culprits, we will be misleading ourselves. The Lord can ban Pete Mewick. It's a partnership business. And the Lord recognized those who are behind it. So I thought you need to tell us more about these partners and what is the Lord doing about them. And has there been any managing partner, senior partner, that is dwelling in, in sand? If there's not, then what can we do? And how can we be involved to make our case? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll respond very uh, yes. quickly. A uh, number of their partners especially at KPMG, Ernst & Young have gone to prison in the US. But that has not stopped this trade. It has simply become just another factor to consider. The big issue, the issues we are looking at are also systemic. There is nobody that I have ever met who's got a genetical structure. There's something in a genetic structure to say, by the way, you must do a bit of tax avoidance, you must do a bit of bribery and corruption. There's nothing in water that we drink that makes us do these things. These things are learned. Therefore, attention has to come back to the kind of institutional structures and value systems. Okay? So, in that sense, by all means, if you, you know, we can chase the individuals, but that won't solve our problem. It's changing the whole value system, the institutional structures. That is what we have to do. How can we change it? Well, we're doing it here. Firstly, by talking about it. Secondly, identifying some of these problems and the damage and say, look, what you think is a narrow relationship between you and your client is actually not the case. Everybody else is affected. Yeah? 
if everybody else is affected, then we have rights. So we have a, you know, I would like to, why not subject all corporations and big accountancy firms to even freedom of inf information laws? Let us find out what on earth they get up to, what kind of contracts, what is behind them. We can withdraw, as I said, the benefit of any limit on their liability. Why do we give them these benefits? For what reason? They haven't earned it. What is the quid pro quo for society for giving this? What are we getting in return? Same for audit. I think audit is probably one of the biggest public frauds of all time. <laughs> uh, reassuring the public all is well and uh, it's nothing of a kind. And that's gone on for years and years and years. And uh, we haven't learned anything from that. And I think in the case of banks, why not get the banking regulators to do the audit? Who do you fear more? The public regulator or the regulator for the private firm? When you come to the airport, your passport is audited. You fear somebody might not let you in. If the public tax collector lands on your door, you fear that more. We fear state-funded independent re regulators, auditors more. Nobody fears the neighborhood friendly auditor from uh, Ernst and Young who's come to do the Lehman audit and say, by the way, there's something called Repo 105. Let's have a chat about this. <laughs> no, nobody fears them. So, we, uh, so I think audit itself has become one of the biggest frauds of all time. And it is, but that's a, another conference, <laughs> another day. <laughs> another conference, <laughs> another day. Okay. Thank you very much, Mitsusika. Thank you. So the next speaker uh, is uh, Nils Johannesen, and his uh, presentation has the title The End of Bank Secrecy, with a question mark, of course. And he will give an evaluation of the G20 tax haven crackdown. Uh, he is now an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen. Um, he researches topics related to offshore tax evasion and avoidance. And he has previously gained hands-on experience with corporate tax planning as a consultant at um, one of the firms, one of the four, uh, I don't know which, and with practical policy issues as a head of a section at Danish, Danish Ministry of Finance. Uh, please, Mr. Janssen. <coughs> yeah, so this is a paper, or this is, uh, yes, this presentation is based on a paper on, uh, on Offshore tax evasion by households. So let me just uh, first make a few general remarks about what, so what we, what do we know and what don't we know about uh, offshore tax evasion by households. So um, first of all, like how much money is involved here? So how much how much money do households have in uh, in havens? Uh, so obviously this is not something you can look up in a book or official statistics, especially because of this lack of transparency in in havens. Nevertheless, there are a few like pretty good. Uh, ways to, to get it like uh, at, the, at the number uh, and reassuring that these ways like get at more or less the same number uh, so it seems to be like a, a pretty reliable estimate that the household uh, own around like six thousand billion dollars in households which corresponds to around eight percent of uh, of all like household financial wealth um, so secondly so how much of this wealth is then associated with uh, with tax evasion well, that's actually a harder question to, to get by. So, uh, so uh, I guess that most of us, based on case stories and uh, anecdotal evidence, would say that probably a lot of this ho uh, offshore wealth escapes taxation, but basically, like very little, like real knowledge uh, uh, exists on, on compliance. So, so people, it's it's not illegal to have a Jersey account or a Cayman account. Uh, so, if, if as long as I re remember to to self-report, of course, my my capital income, uh, we don't we know very little about that. But what we can say is that uh, that much of this wealth could be uh, untaxed. So the bottom line here is that the, so there is like a very significant <laughs> fraction of uh, of total household wealth which is parked uh, in in tax havens, and uh, so it's not surprising that there's that this policy agenda has become very important uh, in the last decade. So how do we how do we bring this capital income earned out there back uh, back into uh, taxation in in the home countries? So uh, this agenda has been addressed or approached in, in different ways uh, by different countries. So in this paper, we look at a, a particular uh, policy initiative that we have that we call the, the G20 tax haven crackdown. Um, so the key tool here in this policy initiative is information exchange treaties. So these are treaties that two countries uh, conclude with each other, 
and then they uh, so under these treaties they can then uh, ask each other for information uh, about uh, their residents. Um, so the OECD has uh, has pushed tax havens for a long time to conclude these treaties, uh, actually since 1998. Uh, but, but in the first many years, uh, nothing really happened. So the, the major tax havens like Switzerland, Singapore, and others flatly refuse like this, this uh, very principle of transparency of information exchange. And many other tax havens actually kind of agree to the principle, but, uh, but in practice, they didn't really sign any treaties. So for the first many years, uh, no treaties were actually signed. Then suddenly, in uh, April 2009, something happens, like a real game changer. So there's a, a G20 summit. This is uh, around the, like just after the financial crisis. There are huge deficits in almost all OECD countries. Uh, people are really tired of banks. They are tired of rich people uh, uh, yeah, not paying taxes. And uh, so, so there's this political, uh, uh, you could say, uh, the agenda comes up again. And, uh, and now something happens. So, uh, so the G20 asks uh, the OECD to draw up a list of non-compliant havens. Uh, they say that a compliant haven is a haven that has signed 12 of these information exchange treaties. Uh, the G20 countries now threaten these havens. Like, so, so they say uh, if, if havens do not comply with this 12 treaty threshold, uh, then they will, uh, they will make economic sanctions against them. And in a matter of, uh, of weeks, actually all havens in the world have uh, so I accepted this, this principle, endorsed this principle of, uh, of transparency and agreed to, to, uh, to sign these at least 12 treaties and actually also start signing treaties. So just, just to illustrate the, like how big a game changer this, this meeting was, uh, I, I've, I've listed here, so this is the, the number for each year since 2004, this list like the number of treaties, uh, information exchange treaties, signed by tax havens. So you can see that there are just very little treaty signing ac activity in the first years. Uh, and then suddenly in, in 2009, there's a huge spike. Uh, havens actually start signing treaties. So the million dollar question is, of course, this. Does it work? Uh, and this is actually kind of a controversial question. So, uh, so the OECD are pretty happy with, uh, with their own work. So they, uh, they suddenly declare that the, now the, the bank secrecy, uh, the area bank, bank secrecy is over. Uh, but this is contested by like NGOs and uh, many tax experts. Uh, there's a nice piece by Nick Jackson and John Christensen uh, called the white. This, they call this the whitewashing of tax havens. Actually, like they say, treaties are are are, uh, are crap. They don't work. Uh, and actually, we are worse off than before because now we put up, put in place a system whereby tax havens can, can just uh, sign 12 treaties, uh, and then they are whitewashed and they are kind of respectable financial centers, uh, which they are not. They claim. So first, so, so, uh, so, so what would be the reasons why this, uh, this doesn't work? Um, so what are the limitations of this G20 approach? Um, first of all, I mean, and pro perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, most worrisome, uh, some people claim that there's something wrong with the very information exchange standard here. So these treaties are based on the standard of information exchange on request. So it means that, uh, that if, for example, Norway signs a treaty with Switzerland, then Norwegian uh, tax authorities can go to Switzerland and say, we would like information about these specific tax pa taxpayers. Uh, they can't just ask about all information about Norwegian taxpayers, but like it has to be specific taxpayers. And also, they have to back up this request by some, some information that supports that there is kind of a reasonable suspicion. So tax authorities need to know something to get information. right? And it, this, this something is really hard to come by. Uh, so, uh, uh, so these information exchange clauses are just not used very frequently. So uh, we know, for example, that, that the US, uh, with like its wide treaty network, only uh, a few hundred times a year actually uh, ask for information uh, under these treaties. So, uh, so it seems that, I mean, just objectively, like, so, so there is a very small risk of getting caught, of getting caught if you uh, <coughs> under these treaties. Um, another uh, important limitation is that the uh, treaty networks are imperfect. I mean, so no country in the world has treaties with all other countries in the world. Uh, so, so even if a country signs treaties with uh, 20 tax havens, there'll still be 30 left where you can, you can move your money if you want to avoid uh, kind of falling under these treaties. Secondly, this, uh, or thirdly, this, uh, this uh, 12 treaty threshold. So, uh, so there have been many treaties between havens. Liechtenstein and Dora have a treaty, for example. Uh, I don't think it has any economic meaning at all. Uh, there, there are treaties between havens and microstates, so Greenland has a number of treaties with, uh, with havens, although there are only 50,000 people living on Greenland. Uh, so 
some people see this as just the attempt of Havens to kind of get to this 12 uh, treaty threshold without giving, uh, giving really any real concessions. Also, there are some concerns about the actual implementation. So do tax havens actually do what they're supposed to do under the treaties? Uh, there's some information from the French uh, Ministry of Finance saying that, I mean, many havens just see it as their job just to confirm information that they already have, not to provide new information. Uh, so that's another, another uh, concern you might have. But then again, I mean, so those people who are in favor of this would say, uh, maybe this is not, this doesn't involve like a huge risk of uh, tax evaders of getting caught. But actually, I mean, maybe just a, a small risk is enough. I mean, if you are uh, a millionaire and you can save taxes like in something that is risk free, you might go ahead and do it. But if there's a, just a small risk that you go to prison for tax evasion, then maybe you, you won't do it. So maybe it works, although like this uh, risk of detection is, is very small. But the point is here that but we, actually, we don't know anything about this. So there's no fact-based knowledge about, the, about how, these, uh, how the economic effects are of these treaties. So the OECD has like a huge uh, like review process. They have uh, hordes of lawyers looking through these treaties and see if they are well-drafted, see if the legislation of havens are well-drafted. But if there is kind of fundamental flaws in the treaties themselves, in the, in, in the very standard of uh, information exchange, then it doesn't matter. I mean, then it's, it's just it's not good enough if the treaties are well-drafted. So this is, of course, what we are after here. We want to see like, whether, like, so what are the economic effects of these treaties? How do they actually affect uh, kind of patterns of, uh, of like, where people put their wealth? So what do we do? So we, uh, so we are lucky enough to, to have access to a, uh, I mean, I'd say like a unique data set, probably like the only data set that could be used for this purpose uh, on bank deposits and tax havens. I'll say more about that in a few seconds. And then we study how and by how much treaties change patterns of uh, offshore deposits. So what do we find? Uh, so just a brief overview here. So contrary to kind of the, the most negative uh, expectations, we actually find that treaties do matter. So treaties do change uh, where people put their, their money. But uh, so the bad news is that, the, that, they, that they change them in the way that they just make, I mean, so to some extent they make tax evaders move funds away from havens that sign treaties towards uh, havens that, that have no treaties with their country of residence. Uh, also, we see no signs of uh, repatriation of wealth. Uh, and finally, we see no signs of increased self-reporting of wealth. So I just, uh, so I mean, uh, of course, there are some, uh, some qualifications here, but it's, I mean, our, our basic message here is that, uh, that it does not seem as if this, uh, this policy initiative has really improved the uh, tax collection as it stands. Okay, so the data part. Uh, so for, when, for like when economists want to uh, kind of make quantitative analysis of, uh, of things relating to offshore things, uh, the main challenge is of course uh, is getting data, right? So how do you how do you get data on these things where like when everything is so so non-transparent and no one is, uh, is really willing to give away information? Uh, we got access to this data set that is called the locational banking statistics of the <coughs> bank for international settlements. So the BIS is kind of the central bank of the central bank. So this is like a very reliable source. Uh, these data are used for many things. So they inputs to kind of current accounts, uh, capital accounts, uh, stuff. So there's no reason to doubt the, the quality of these, uh, of these uh, statistics. Uh, these bank statistics, they cover all financial centers. So basically, like if when a financial center get big, gets big enough, then the BIS includes it in their, in their, uh, in their list of, uh, of countries. So, uh, and, and within each country uh, it, that is, uh, that is uh, reporting to the, these statistics, there is almost full coverage. So you cover all banks basically within these, these countries that are included by the statistics. So good for us here. So there are among these uh, like major financial centers covered by this uh, data source, there are 19 havens. Uh, and for 14 of those, we, we have, so then we see bilateral deposit data. So for example, for Switzerland, Luxembourg, and Cayman, we have bilateral deposit data, meaning uh, we see, for example, so what is the total value of uh, deposits owned by Norwegians in Switzerland? What is the total value of deposits owned by Germans in Luxembourg? What is the total value of uh, deposits owned by US citizens in the Cayman Islands? Uh, and then there are five more here for which we only observe kind of the, the aggregate, so the, like the total amount of, uh, of foreign deposits. Um, so this, uh, this is a great uh, data source, probably the only one you could use for this type of uh, study, but it, never it, it, it has some limitations. Uh, so one is that it includes deposits owned by corporations and funds. So we really want to study like, the behavior of tax of, of uh, households. So here we have like, a measure of deposits that includes deposits owned by households, but also deposits owned by, by funds and corporations. 
Uh, it includes only bank deposits. Of course, there are other forms of offshore wealth. You can hold wealth uh, like through a custodian bank in, in the form of uh, securities. Uh, that is not covered. Uh, and then a final thing, so this is based on uh, immediate ownership rather than ultimate uh, ownership uh, basis. So this means that uh, if I am a Norwegian guy, I own a Swiss, uh, Swiss bank account in the name of a uh, Panamanian uh, shell corporation, then in the statistics it looks as if the deposit is owned by, by someone in Panama. And it, it's clearly not, right? It's, uh, so, um, yeah, so, so there's like, and this is actually like a pretty big chunk of these deposits that we, that we basically cannot say uh, uh, who owns because they are there, there's this uh, shell entity probably uh, in between the, the real owner and the, the assets. Okay. Um, so how do we get about this analysis? So uh, so we conduct uh, both a graphical analysis. We look at just the raw numbers, put them up in in nice uh, uh, scatter plots. Uh, I'll show you some of these graphs. Also, we conduct uh, kind of standard uh, panel regression analysis. I won't get into <laughs> the details of that. Uh, I'm not sure there are so many economists uh, here, so I'll, I'll just skip that and, and get to what we actually find. Okay, so uh, what, are our, our, what are the results? First result. A treaty between a country and a haven causes a 15% drop in the bank deposits held by the country in the haven. So when Norway signs a treaty with Switzerland, Norwegian deposits in Switzerland drops by 15%. How should we interpret that? Is that, a, is that a big number or a small number? It depends, right? So, uh, so, so first of all, we, we think that these responses come only from households. So you, we don't think of uh, corporations and trusts as uh, tax evaders. So, uh, so it's probably like this only comes from, from uh, households. But our measure of deposits includes both households and uh, these uh, trusts and uh, corporations. So, um, if I should interpret this, I would uh, do it in the following way. I would say, okay, let's assume that, uh, that corporations and trusts do not respond to these treaties. They shouldn't be affected. Let's assume that half of these deposits in havens are, uh, like actually belong to households. This is like a number that, that people typically use. So that would mean that this 15% drop in total bank deposits corresponds to a 30% uh, drop in deposits owned by households under these two assumptions. So this is still, I mean, so it, this is a significant response, but uh, but I mean, other these kind of uncertain assumptions, but it's uh, it's still it's still a minority of uh, of uh, of households responding, right? So most of of uh, pe most of the people with with uh, uh, deposits in these offshore jurisdictions seem to just leave their money where they are when a treaty is signed. So I promised you some uh, some graphical stuff also that is maybe easier to relate to. So uh, what I do in this graph is uh, that we uh, so so we have this bilateral data for 14 havens uh, against 200 uh, counterpart countries, so all countries in the world. So that gives us uh, 2,800 country haven pairs, right? So what I do here is that I I, I group these uh, country haven pairs into two groups: those that signed a treaty between 2008 and 2011, and those that did not. So the ones that signed the treaty is the is the the, the bold line. And those that did not sign a treaty is the is the dotted line. So you see that these, I mean, these two groups of deposits, like in, in each of these uh, groups, followed each other pretty nicely up until 2008, and then there's kind of a small drop in the deposits owned by, or like in these haven country pairs that signed a treaty, relative to those that did not sign a treaty. Um, so this is it, it looks like a, a modest response, but again, like how to interpret this really depends on like, so what is kind of what is the what is the the subgroup of uh, of, uh, of people who actually responded to this. Uh. <coughs> okay. Result number two. Uh, a treaty between a country and a haven causes a 0.6% increase in bank deposits held by the country in each of the other havens in the world. So if Norway signs a treaty with, uh, with uh, Switzerland, you see a 15% drop in the region deposits in Switzerland, and you see a 0.6% increase in the region owned deposits in all of the other havens in the world. So in Luxembourg, Singapore, uh, what have you, suddenly like uh, deposits go up. Um, so you can twist you can twist this result a little you can twist the model a little bit to, to get even closer to something uh, that is uh, kind of intuitive. So uh, so if Norway signs a treaty with, with Switzerland, so when would you expect to see shifting 
uh, to Luxembourg. Well, only if Luxembourg does not have a treaty with, Luxembourg, with, uh, with Norway, right? There's no, no reason to expect people to try to escape a treaty by shifting the money to a haven that already has a treaty. So, you, so if you kind of allow this, this shifting effect to, to depend on whether the receiving country has a treaty or does not have a treaty with the country, then you get the following results. So a treaty between a country and a haven causes a 1.2% increase in the bank deposits in the havens that do not have a treaty with the country, and there is no change in the, in the havens that, that, uh, that do have a treaty. So if Luxembourg has a treaty with Norway, and Norway has a treaty with, treaty with Switzerland, then nothing happens in Luxembourg. If Luxembourg has no treaty with Norway, and Norway has a treaty with Switzerland, then you see like a 1.2% increase in Norwegian deposits in Luxembourg. So this is kind of uh, so this is like pretty strong evidence, I think, of uh, of shifting that really so kind of stocks go up where they're supposed to if people were moving uh, their money around uh, in order to avoid uh, these uh, these treaties. So how does this show in the in the aggregate data? Um, so here we have the 19 uh, 19 havens plotted in this uh, diagram. So on the x-axis here, you have the number of treaties uh, signed by these uh, these havens. So there's Jersey that signed uh, 19 havens in this period. There's, si there's Panama that signed only five. Uh, and then on the y-axis, you have the change in the, in the total stock of uh, the ones that they attract over this period. So you can see that, uh, that the havens that signed little treaties uh, attracted many more uh, deposits, so they gained market share. So Panama got like a, an 80% increase in, their, in what they attract from, from foreigners. Uh, whereas Jersey, Jersey that signed uh, these seven, 18 treaties, they, they saw like a 60% reduction in the stock of deposits that they, uh, that they attract from foreigners. So this is also consistent with this uh, shifting story, right? You just see kind of, uh, so the most compliant uh, tax havens, they lose market shares in this global market for offshore deposits uh, to these uh, less compliant havens. Okay, result number three. Uh, no repatriation of offshore deposits. Um, this is a bit tricky to get at this question, so if people re repatriate it, because we don't actually observe repatriation in our data set. Uh, so what I, what I plotted here is so that the, 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 the bold line here is the total stock of deposits in all offshore havens. So you can see that this, uh, so, so this goes, from, uh, goes up like in the first part of the sample period up until 2008, and then it kind of flattens out, so there's, uh, there's the, the same kind of total amount of deposits in havens now as there was before this, uh, this tax haven crackdown. There's around uh, $3,000 billion uh, in deposits. So of course you could argue that uh, perhaps like if there had been no like treaty uh, tax haven crackdown, then I mean you would have seen a higher growth. So what is the counterfactual here? What is uh, what is it that uh, what would have happened if there had been no treaties? Um, so of course we can't we, we don't we can't produce like a, a really reliable counterfactual. Uh, it, uh, we only note, you know, that the, that this is the time of the financial crisis. So, like all these international international financial transfers, transfers goes down. If you compare to, for example, the dotted line here, which is the the total deposits in all non-haven countries, so the total deposits in Germany, the U.S., France, for which for, uh, for whom uh, nothing changed because they already had these treaties, you see like a similar decline around 2008, 2009. So, uh, so the total amount of, uh, of, of deposits in these, in these havens has been constant over this period. Another piece of evidence in favor of this, uh, this uh, conjecture here that there is no repatriation of, uh, of deposits is this figure here. So here we look at, at each OECD country. So there are like 20 something OECD countries here. And we look at as a function of how many treaties they signed with, with havens, how much did their total stock of haven deposits change? And you see that there's just no correlation here at all. So, uh, so there's France that signed 15 uh, treaties with the 19 uh, havens in our sample. They saw like a, a small increase in their haven deposits. And there's Chile that signed no treaties, and they also saw a small increase in their haven deposits. So it's just not that, that those countries that signed many treaties achieved a reduction in the, in the stock of, uh, of deposits uh, held offshore. Result number four, uh, no increase in compliance. 
So this is even more tricky to get at, because like in this data set, we only observe deposits. So we actually we see nothing uh, about uh, like whether people actually self-report their income or not. So you could claim that maybe people just left their money in Switzerland, Luxembourg, and whatever, but these treaties had this uh, beneficial effect that they caused people to, to self-report their income, because they're now they're afraid of getting caught. And we can't see this in this uh, main data set from the BIS. So, uh, so we had to find kind of another data source that would allow us to, to get at this question. Uh, and what we use is uh, a Swiss data set that has actually direct information on, uh, on compliance, you can say, on voluntary disclosure of interest income. So I need, I mean, to explain like why this is the case, I need to just uh, say a few words of background here. So, uh, so Switzerland has for a number of years cooperated with the European Union on something called the Savings Tax Directive. So under this directive, if I, as a Dane, a European resident, put money on a Swiss account, Switzerland will actually impose a withholding tax on my interest income and send the money to Denmark, most of it. Um, so, it's a, so it's pretty costly now. There's a big tax cost of, uh, of having like, Swiss deposits if you are an EU resident. But under this directive, uh, EU, as we told, I, I can escape this withholding tax if I accept that the bank disclosed my interest income to Denmark. Okay? So the, the, the default in Switzerland is anonymity, that I'm just tax, taxed anonymously and the money is sent back to Denmark, but I can avoid this withholding tax if I let the bank tell my tax authorities at home how much interest income I had. So Switzerland actually, so Switzerland, Switzerland actually uh, publishes these figures. So they, for each of these e uh, EU countries, they publish so how much, how mu what was the withholding tax revenue, so how much of this interest income was, was taxed, and how much interest income was kind of inf uh, was passed on to the, I mean, how, was, how much information on inf interest income was passed on to the home countries. So for each of these 27 EU countries, we can compute the fraction of Swiss interest income which is voluntarily dis disclosed uh, to the tax authorities. So this is like a direct measure of, uh, of compliance, a direct measure of voluntary disclosure. So at least for one haven, and for this sample of 27 uh, home countries, we, have, we can actually conduct a proper test of whether there was uh, an increase in compliance as a function of these treaties. And the picture looks like this. So uh, again, we group these uh, 27 countries into two groups, those that, uh, that signed a treaty with Switzerland during this period, and uh, another group that did not sign a treaty with Switzerland. And this is kind of the average fraction of, uh, of, uh, of interest income that is, that is disclosed uh, voluntarily. So the first thing to note is that uh, these figures are pretty low. So it's like 10, 20 percent of, uh, of households disclose. Uh, the rest are willing to pay this 35 percent withholding tax. Also note that there is kind of an increase in trends. So it seems that uh, I mean compliance is actually increasing in Switzerland among uh, people with, with money there. But the last thing to note is that there is no there is no difference uh, between like those who signed a treaty and those who did not sign a treaty. So the treaty does not seem to have kind of a an extra effect on compliance relative to, uh, to just other countries. So of course this is, uh, I mean, so, so there could be compliance effects in other, in other havens. This is just like one important haven, Switzerland. There could be other things going on in other havens, but this is at least suggested e evidence that there, is, uh, that there is no increase in compliance uh, caused by these treaties. Okay. Result number five. Uh, Evaders with sham corporations may have responded strongly. So this comes back to, uh, to the presentation from yesterday about these shell, shell corporations. So as I, was, as I was saying before, kind of actually like uh, around a quarter of all deposits in havens are assigned to other havens in these big statistics. So around a quarter of deposits in Switzerland are kind of officially owned by someone in Panama, someone in the BVI, someone in, the, uh, in, other, in, in, other, in other havens. So we don't believe that these, I mean, that these people, that these, these deposits are really owned by someone in Panama or the BVI. So these, this really must reflect these uh, shell structures that uh, we heard about yesterday. Um, so, uh, so in all the results you see until now, we basically thrown away this uh, this one quarter of uh, observations. Just to say, okay, we, we don't know. I mean, we, we just we, we don't know who owns Swiss deposits that are assigned to Panama. We just know that they're, they're probably not Panamanians who own all these billions of deposits uh, held in Switzerland. So in what you've seen until now, we just uh, threw these uh, observations out. So here we look at, so actually, so uh, 
we try to try, try to look at so how how these democracies then respond, how how did they then respond to treaties? So of course we cannot say uh, we still don't know who owned these deposits. So we see uh, like a Panama owned deposits in Switzerland. We don't know who actually owns it, uh, but still we can see how this this type of deposits respond to treaties. So what we find here is that uh, a treaty between a country and a haven causes a one percent drop in the bank deposits held in the haven through other havens. So when Norway signs a treaty with Switzerland, <coughs> deposits from Panama drops. So when uh, Denmark signs a treaty with uh, Luxembourg, uh, deposits uh, from uh, the BVI into Luxembourg drops. So of course, I mean this is this is also a bit suggestive, but but it's kind of it's it's a it's a pattern that is uh, that uh, yeah that suggests that uh, that that also people with sham corporations uh, responded. So should they respond? Should we uh, uh, expect them to, to respond? Yes, they should. So if I am a Norwegian holding a sham corporation in Panama, owning deposits in Switzerland, mm. I should be worried about a treaty between Switzerland and Norway because treaties look through these structures. I mean, so the, the corporation is just a piece of paper in Panama, and Norwegian tax authorities can get like at this uh, this corporation. So we should expect something like this. On the other hand, a treaty between a haven and another haven. So Switzerland and Panama sign a treaty with each other. Nothing happens. And, and they shouldn't. I mean, because if I'm Norwegian and I hold my money in Switzerland through a Panama corporation, I don't care about a treaty between Switzerland and Panama. This, I mean, no one's going to come after me with this treaty. Yeah. So uh, I'll wrap up. This was pretty close. Uh, it's pretty fast, a bit faster than I thought. But uh, it's the last presentation, so you can maybe. <laughs> Uh, just conclude uh, the main findings. We find that actually, I mean, so these treaties they do have uh, significant effects on the patterns of offshore uh, offshore deposits. But I mean, but most likely these uh, these I mean these responses were kind of small, and they most likely reflected uh, deposits shifting, so shifting from havens with treaties to havens without haven uh, without treaties, uh, and not repatriation of funds and not. Uh, compliance, not uh, more self-reporting. So we think that this, these findings, uh, to, to the extent that you believe them, that they, they, they point towards a, a policy agenda. First of all, I mean the fact that you see a significant amount of, of uh, deposit shifting really suggests that countries should endeavor to uh, to complete treaty networks. It's just not good enough to have uh, 30 treaties. You need you need uh, treaties with all 50 havens in the world. The second uh, point here is perhaps a bit more uh, questionable, but, but to the extent that we are right about these assumptions about the, the fraction of, of uh, deposits owned by households, uh, so, that, so that, this, that, that it's actually true that these, uh, these responses were kind of small, it seems that the majority of tax, tax evaders are not really afraid of the treaties. So this really speaks of, uh, in favor of, of making treaties more demanding. So, uh, so there's a small risk implied by these treaties of getting caught. Uh, there are many ways you could make these treaties more demanding. One way would be to have uh, automatic reporting, of course, instead of, uh, instead of uh, information exchange upon request. So, uh, yeah, that's all I had. Um, as far as I understand, y your advice is make all the treaties uh, for all the countries. Uh, and could you tell me or the, the audience how uh, far away are we from that goal? Uh, how many in percentage of possible treaties? Yeah, I mean, you, I you have this. Uh, this sure, graph. I, mean, I just uh, I didn't count. I didn't uh, count lately, but uh, Is I it mean, like you, twenty percent. I would say no. I would say that right. so, for the, so I think for the OECD countries, it's not so far away. It's probably like probably like 40, 50 percent like toward the goal. Okay. But for developing countries, uh, I mean, we're almost maybe 1 percent, 2 percent. There are like, very few treaties between the developing countries and, uh, and havens. Mm. But, but you had some findings uh, or some facts in the beginning of how much was deposited uh, in percentage of household wealth, yeah, like 8 percent, I yes. think you said. Is that mainly um, rich people in the rich countries, in the OECD countries? So we don't, uh, yeah, I mean, so we don't really know. I mean, uh, I mean, so, yeah, of course, like, it's, it's a lot of pe people from the OECD countries, but also, of course, rich elites in, uh, mm. in third world countries. Mm. Yeah. But 
Uh, the conclusion should be that this is working, but it's not perfect. But if we try to push the agenda, uh, it should be ha should have some effect. I mean, I think the benign interpretation is that uh, that this uh, could be working. I mean, at least to some extent, if uh, if you would like sign more treaties, uh, but you could, I mean. You could really, I mean, you could really still doubt whether you would ever get any compliance effects or any repatriation effects. Uh, that, uh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, just one final kind of technical question. You had one graph with Greece as an yes, outlier. Yes, that's a very could interesting. You, could you just yes. show that? What was I didn't. Uh, so this shows uh, so how the total stock of offshore deposits uh, changed from 2008 to 2011 for all OCD countries. Uh, and you see that, uh, that for Greece, uh, this uh, increased by 200%. Uh, so this is like a clear example of, of capital flight, right? And uh, that, uh, that Greece, Greeks are just uh, worried that their banks might collapse or that they'll have to start paying taxes, whatever. So they, they really sent, uh, <laughs> sent their money abroad in, in big Do numbers. Do you know how much money that is? Uh, so that's actually something that I cannot disclose. So this is not public data. So, uh, so I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know it, and you can tell us. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> this is no press in uh. the room. <laughs> <laughs> so much for transparency. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, you know it, and it's not public. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. That's <laughs> good. That's not good. But but uh, the BIS they publish a lot of uh, locational uh, so, so uh, bank data. So what they what they do publish is that they do publish for each haven they publish the total amount of uh, foreign deposits. Okay. For each uh, counterpart country, they they uh, they publish the total amount of, uh, of foreign deposits. So like uh, the total amount of deposits held by Norwegians somewhere abroad. But what we got is this country by country data that uh, that is so not public what available. What you say, we are not able to see how much Norwegians have deposited in Switzerland. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's a pity. But uh, yeah, that's a pity. So that I mean, that of course should be changed. Uh, they should. Uh, there is a follow-up question. I've got the mic, so I'm going to use my prerogative. But um, <laughs> it's not on. Well, I'll just uh, do you think this data should be public? And how do you think we can go about getting this data public? Because obviously that is, I mean, I saw that slide and it, it, it tells a story just in that picture. Yeah. Um, and why is this data collected by a public body, uh, not in the public domain? I mean, uh, so that's a very good question. Right, and, uh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not from the BIS. I would be happy to have this, uh, this data published uh, any day. And, I <coughs> and it's very important, right? So I mean, so if, if these data were public, then people could, I mean, then it would be like just uh, just be a click away from really following like this uh, this fight against uh, against tax evasion, right? And everybody could just sit down at the computer and and, and track like how's it going, like, uh, and uh, and now it's not possible. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just want to ask this question. I don't know if it is uh, it is more of rhetorics. Considering what tax havens cost and uh, our broader understanding of them not just being tax havens, but uh, secrecy jurisdiction that facilitate corruption and cause rot. As developing countries, should we be working towards treaties with them or working towards getting rid of them? I'm not sure I get the question. You're talking about treaties yes. with tax havens. Yes. You said there are about 1% developing countries, yes. but they are the OAC countries, they are getting around. Should we be working towards treaties with them? Would that help our cause? I mean, or should we be thinking of how to work together to see if we can completely eradicate them? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good uh, question. Uh, I think that one important point is that these treaties are really tools. I mean, they, so they are tools, but they're not really useful in themselves. So you need like a pretty sophisticated tax administration, I think, to, to have any use of them. I mean, you need resources to pursue these cases. You have to go out and actually ask questions. So, uh, so if, if, uh, if you have like, a lack of resources in your tax administration already, and probably, uh, I mean, they just then they probably are, are not very useful. Uh, so, I think Mr. So Blum here has another some. another question. Isn't the FACTA uh, law in the U.S. that's forcing a new kind of treaty much more important than the OECD nonsense that we're talking about here? Yeah. So, so sure. So, uh, so. This, I mean, as I'm not an expert on the U.S. FATCA, but as I understand it, this is this is uh, this is a more demanding kind of treaty that actually like has some kind of uh, automatic reporting. So this is not 
it's really what the U.S. has to go and ask about specific, specific persons, but actually they will get information about all U.S. residents automatically every year. Yes, it's, it's leading to parallel agreements where the U.S. will supply the other country on the other side with the same kind of automatic reporting. So, for example, within the last day, we've been reading about negotiations between the U.S. and Mexico on automatic exchange, which could have a profound impact. So, yeah, okay. is that a question or a comment? Or? It's, a, it's a comment, but <laughs> yeah. it suggests that, that the treaties that are evolving under that regime yeah. are going to be much more important than the stuff that OECD is. I, I couldn't agree more, yeah. I would like to say thank you uh, once again. It's a pity that uh, all the data are not available. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, some good stories there. Uh, uh, <laughs> I will uh, start with uh, a few questions to the panel and then I will open for the audience to, um, to uh, ask questions to the panel. And I would like to start with Tina because I, I interpreted her to be very pessimistic. Uh, the, the question is, are we moving forward or backward uh, given the, the interest of the people? Uh, attending the conference uh, to fight financial secrecy and vested interests. Oh, I'm sorry to 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 sound so so depressing. I didn't mean to. Uh, in the presentation, I was focusing on why political corruption is allowed to continue in some countries. I didn't mean that everything we do uh, are are f uh, failures. Um, and I think. Well, if you just look at this conference, it's a, it's a big step in the right direction. We are here from so many different uh, communities and different experts coming together. It's fun financed by NORAD. It's, uh, it's, so, so I think this, uh, this conference in itself proves that we are something is, is, is going in the right direction. Mm. Um, so, so, but, and, and I think we have to consider the many different initiatives mm. and see, s s look at the progress and... Um, and uh, and when I when I look at the different um, challenges, mm. I see I see progress in on, on in many areas. So I so I just wanted to. So you mm. you are on the positive side all all over. I'm not saying that are not the challenges are yeah. tremendous, and mm. I think we uh, we need to have the voters yeah. in many countries with us. Mm. But uh, but um, um, I just wanted to correct. This mm. impression I had made, made and, a little bit. And, uh, and uh, follow up with you, Mr. Baker. Uh, you're working in the bar. Uh, what's, what's your impression? I think that there is some progress, but an enormous amount to be done. Mm. Um, I think that the conduct, for instance, of Switzerland towards the Abacha mm. investigation, where well over half a billion US dollars went back to Nigeria is a, is a positive thing. Mm. And I think certain jurisdictions are trying to get the message out that they don't want to hold this corrupt money mm. and that if it's there, they'll respond positively and appropriately. And that's positive. Mm. But the problem of corruption is just almost overwhelming. It's mm. terribly, terribly difficult. And we need to work out how to deal with greed, which is a bit of a problem. Mm. Mm. Uh, Nils, um, you studied the effect of the G20 tax uh, have been cracked on, uh, and you have presented the results. Um, would you say that that was a kind of once in a lifetime uh, action because of the financial crisis, or do you think <coughs> no, it's a process going on in the G20 that will be followed up? Will someone look at your uh, research and, and see how, how the effect has been? That's a good question. <laughs> Uh, so I think that I mean my impression is that it's something that is going on. That I mean, so that the OECD, I mean, so despite the fact that these treaties are not perfect, they they do like put a lot of effort into it and, and reviewing and, and changing like these havens, uh, legal infrastructure, so to speak. Uh, so so they are important initiatives in other countries. So I mean, so Switzerland is a negotiating other treaties with with uh, Germany and, and the UK, which also kind of come out of of this uh, treaty signing 
uh, process. Mm. The U.S. has we heard that with the Fed cat also like going the same same direction. So I think that I mean that it is something that is moving on and and uh, and. We kind of, yeah. Everybody is, is set on the goal now that we want to to bring this uh, these fortunes under effective taxation, and I think that uh, hopefully it won't stop until we get to the to the goal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sik. I I, I uh, wanted you to be the last one because I thought you were mo mainly the um, possibly the most pessimistic because you you, you painted a picture of a culture that was so ingrained. Uh, by the big four firms that control the the audit business worldwide, uh, are you are you that pessimistic that no, uh, they are not moving f forward uh, according to your analysis. Uh, on the contrary, they are being more and more uh, advanced in tax avoidance and evasion. Well, it's hard to imagine big accounting firms worrying about social responsibility other than kind of a rhetorical statement. Their primary interest is welfare of capital and wealthy elites. You know, uh, many people, if they have a big problem, they will say, let's speak to God. So I did the same too on this. <laughs> and I got in a queue, and there were two people in front of me. The first one was Obama. And uh, Obama said, oh, Lord. When will the U.S. economy pick up? Yeah, and the boy said, another 10 years, my son. <laughs> then it was George Papandreou. He said, when will Greece come out of austerity? He said, another 20 years, my son. Then it was my turn. I said, when will accountants give up tax avoidance? And the voice said, my son, then even I won't be around. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real business. <laughs> That's the scale of the problem we are up against. And I feel that we are looking at through very kind of rose-tinted glasses. We are not looking at the neoliberal culture, neoliberal entrepreneurialism, which is so deeply embedded, which is about wealth for individuals. It's not about collective care. So if we want to address these things, sure, we've got to tackle them at the level of the individual too, like I suggested. We've got to have sanctions, no public contracts for anybody selling tax avoidance. We've got to hold them responsible for the schemes they market. But ultimately, there's an issue about the system, the ideology, the value systems. Some people say, let us shut down tax havens. Look, I have a lot of good friends in Jersey. I've been there many times. I know people in other places. They deserve a good life. Okay, they deserve to have a good standard of life, which they can't eke out of, out of fisheries or agriculture or tourism. And you've got to think about how you're going to enable these places to earn a good standard of life. You can't just say, you know, in globalization, the microstates are simply marketing their sovereignty and developing capital-friendly laws. But there must be other ways. So we have to look at how global trade is conducted for example. No good the Colombians grow in coffee and the price is fixed in London, which doesn't grow any coffee. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So we're going to look at the way the global trade is uh, done, how the institutions work, many other things. But I can't see accountancy firms reforming themselves on their own. It just hasn't happened. It's not going to happen. Okay. Um, one more question from, uh, from my side before I let the audience uh, ask. Um, Friand, you started with uh, stating that uh, a company has a zero IQ, uh, and it's all about people. Um, and, and it's people, uh, they, uh, the attitude, what people are willing to do, uh, how they, they get opportunities uh, to do good or to do, do bad. Mm. And uh, I may, uh, I think maybe all we all agree it's all about people. But what is for, for these organizations? What from that starting point? What should I concentrate on? Uh, that depends very much on the goal. If the goal is to uh, go after corruption, you have to follow the money. If the goal is to provide for better regulation, you have to go for the politicians. Uh, if the goal is to um, get better information so that you can take more informed decisions, you have to go for transparency. 
uh, on a country by country basis for companies. Mm -hmm. So so it's really what 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 goal you have and and I think you need to go for all of those mm. at least mm. and then some. Mm. But I was also thinking about what mm. kind of attitude uh, it's it, the individual have. Uh, how how do you how do you, do you get individuals to accept that uh, we are all better off without corruption, without vested interest, mm. uh, with the openness? It, it it has been said previously here today that. It's, it's not our education system that's the problem. Mm. Uh, the tax avoidance is not taught at NHH. Mm. At least I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but I assume that it's not done that. <laughs> but but uh, yes, it's it's taught very uh, much within the companies. And, and as I said previously, any lawyer or any accountant or auditor that has been at least to three courses mm. will have to have been exposed to it. Mm. And and therefore, it's the responsibility of all the auditors mm. to secure that you can actually uh, get a better profession. You can't say that it's only the the large companies. It's all the all the auditors, the small auditors, the large auditors, the employees of the auditing companies, mm. and the same you will probably have to see with the lawyers. Mm. You can't get it fixed. Yes, you can get outside people to to work uh, a new legislation for lawyers mm. but you can't change the attitudes unless the lawyers are actually part of it mm. uh, Tina what's your thinking about this issue about um, and culture? well at the faculty of law now I'm studying crime and how we should how should society should respond to crime and and in the literature one of the things we find is that the propensity to to um, to respect the law mm. is higher among people who agree with the law. Mm. So and and also it is also higher when the rules come from a legitimate government. So so I think I think we have to consider how the rules are produced and how who produce them and how big share of the population is actually following the rules because that will also affect how many others who will mm -hmm. follow the rules. So I don't think we can say separate between uh, people within, uh, of course corporate culture is important, mm. but at the same time we have to hold the individuals mm. responsible mm. and and for for sanctions I think I think it is impossible not to sanction the companies but it will all there should always be a combination mm. so that both individuals and the companies are sanctioned. Mm. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, okay. a, I suspect that there's a very small group of people who are involved in grand scale corruption and the laundering of the funds and that would include people from companies who organize the payments of um, the bribes and I think society shouldn't shy away from prosecuting the directors of companies, the lawyers, the accountants, the bankers who um, facilitate this mm. and one of the things that hasn't really happened to date is a, is a concerted effort after lawyers, accountants, directors uh, and bankers and that needs to happen. Mm. And Nils, you're an economist. Uh, do you believe that it's only uh, economic <coughs> incentives that's the big thing uh, to change? Uh yeah, that's, uh, that's precisely. I mean, I think that I'm not very optimistic about changing people's nature, you know, maybe, maybe make, making people good and abide laws by themselves, like you really have to make incentives. Uh, so, I mean, if, if, if there's no risk associated with the uh, tax evasion and aggressive tax planning, of course, people are going to do it. But if, if you are afraid of getting, I mean, if there's a re real risk of getting caught, then, uh, then people will, will think twice, I think. Uh, so that's the way to go. Mm. And <coughs> exactly what you say about the auditing firm. So they have to, there has to be sanctions against them. Sure, to they have for, for changing their attitude sure. and, and way of, uh, of uh, working. Yeah, sure, there have to be sanctions, but I think we all are also have to take issue with this idea of incentives. Does a nurse really need incentives to provide a good care for a patient? Does he or she really need to be paid a bonus because you've done a good job looking after a patient? I think we have to look at the whole of this culture that there has to be an economic payoff. What can we just do? 
what we think is a good and right thing to do. Does the teacher really need a bonus at the end of each lecture to say, yes, you taught your subject well, here is a bonus. So I think this culture itself is also very, very corrosive. And we have to look at the way stock markets exert incessant pressure on corporate executives to generate higher and higher profits. There's no limit to this. We have to look at a culture which says, if you've got a bigger bank balance, bigger house, bigger yacht, more suits, somehow you really made it. And we, you know, we talked about empirical evidence. There is empirical ev evidence in every house, every street, every week, a million people die. They all go empty-handed. Yet there are people around chasing these pieces of paper which they can't spend, they can't take it with them. It makes everybody else's, lots of other people's life a misery. And I think it's time to you know, get, in, uh, get in touch with these people and say, what on earth are you doing? So I actually gave a talk at, there was a lot of millionaires, somehow don't know, I think they were mistaken there and asked me to speak <laughs> there. And, uh, and this guy, who I won't name, stood up and said, we can do anything, he said. And that was actually frightening. He said, we can do anything, anything. Mm. I had to give him a very simple test. Mm. In front of me, there was a flower. I said, can you pull the petals? <laughs> and he pulled the petals in rage uh, at my talk. I said, now can you put it back? <laughs> oh, can't do that. So you're no different from any of the rest of us, are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? And uh, so I think we have to confront some of these peoples the way they think. But they basically will not be inviting people from this kind of audience for a chat. So that, what that means is we have to then engage at every level, as I said, at a grassroots level, public policy level, changing vocabularies, ideologies, meaning systems. We, li we live for a very short period and every human being on this planet deserves to live a good life. Mm. Uh. I now invite the audience to make uh, comments or uh, questions. Um, my name is Mohamed Kone. I come from Sierra Leone. Uh, I practice journalism. Um, I want to know where lies the problem in prosecuting leaders, especially leaders from African countries that have money sitting in Swiss banks. And secondly, what is the difference between a common thief on the street and people who invade taxes. And um, we are talking about signing treaties. If developing countries, African countries, do sign treaties with tax havens, don't you think it's a new form of corruption that will be taken back to these people? Thank you. Uh, I would like to, uh, I think, <coughs> Mr. Baker. Yeah, I, th I think that that's a very difficult question legally and practically. <coughs> I think that um, the responsibility for doing that has to really fall within the country that the man or woman is the leader of. They've got to prosecute that person from s for, for stealing from them. And the problem with that is that very infrequently is that there, is there the political will to do that so that a man who ceases to be president or prime minister frequently remains very, very powerful within his country for um, tens, tens of years, decades for the rest of his life. So it becomes almost impossible for the, um, for the domestic country to prosecute. And there are all sorts of legal problems with another country trying to prosecute a leader of a, or a former leader uh, of a country for um, stealing from his own country. I think Tim Daniel's still here. He's probably got more to say than me on this, but there's a, all sorts of immunities to presidents and prime ministers, which it would be almost impossible for um, us to get to get to get round without a breakdown of um, the way the world functions on a, on a political level. So what you sometimes find, what you quite often find, is that it's um, people who don't have an immunity who get prosecuted. So with a batcher. It was when well, Bachi was dead, but a, a man called Bagudu, who um, was his money launderer in chief, he became a focus of the investigation to see if you could prosecute the man who didn't possess the immunities which leaders have. 
So it, might, it probably falls into the category of us having to have a new world order, which is being <laughs> promoted to my left. I think we we'll <coughs> continue with your question here, and then the lady behind later. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Godfrey Walalazi. I'm coming from uh, Tanzania, Sebastian Kolo Memorial University, Institute of Justice and Peace. And uh, what I want to, it's not a question actually, it's a plea. And uh, my plea is to all of uh, the delegates here, but specifically to the Western uh, citizens, and more specifically to the Western media. It has been very common to hear on corrupt leaders and bribery being written so much about the developing country leaders, Africa and other places. But it takes two to tango. And we have known and we've seen from all these three days that no matter what is happening in these African countries, there are so many people behind in the Western world. And we're not talking about them. We are just pointing fingers to and say the development is not there in these countries because of the corrupt and bribe leaders. Why are we not painting the same picture of those companies and those people who are paying these leaders in the developing countries? So for me, I would like to see, if possible, from now, continuous in the, in the media, when they say there's no development because of the poor leadership and corrupt leaders, as well as corrupt institutional institutions in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Western world. So the center should not be ending up with only corrupt leaders in developing countries or Africa, but you say corrupt leaders in Africa and corrupt institutions <laughs> in collaboration. <laughs> so with that, I think we'll be coming to the one of the step of balancing. I like the wisdom that are being given by uh, Professor Sik here, but then let's advance the, the statement also. In whatever kind of circle we're talking about bribe, bribe, let's not end only in those poor, poor developing country leaders. Let's put in picture also the institutions in the Western world, be it the Switzerland banks, be it the KPMG, and it should be in collaboration. That statement will also make them ashamed of what they're doing. I think that's a very good Thank advice. you very much. And the, the lady behind there. Yeah, my name is, uh, my name is Gladys uh, Domi Mananyu from uh, South Sudan. I work with the Sudan Council of Churches. My concern here is uh, exactly what uh, Professor has put across. It's not really a question, but a really concern. Uh, the issue here is uh, we talk about this corruption. We talk about the farms who are also helping the corrupt people. But the, the, the area where we need to focus on is not being talked on, just like my brother has put it. What about the, the lower people who are not able to get to this kind of conference to know exactly what is going on? And uh, the second thing is we have <coughs> these issues. We know them, but we are not confronting them. So what is there that we can do collectively that we can be able to confront these uh, uh, leaders who are behind all this. And then the third one is, we talk about uh, these countries where most of this uh, uh, corruption uh, is taking place. But we are not really talking about the, 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 the countries where most of these laws are also being made. The, the, the laws are there in those respective countries, but we are not reflecting on the international laws. We put, they put these laws, but there is no law that can really apprehend such kind of people who go against these kind of laws. So my, my concern here is the kind of presentation you have put here will help us, but uh, how do we translate it? so that it can make impact on those countries where a lot of these uh, scenarios are being seen. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one uh, more here. Uh. Thank you. Yes, uh, in response to the gentleman from Sierra Leone, 
uh, and as uh, Steve indicated, I might have something to say um, on the question of prosecution of um, leaders who've uh, robbed their countries. As Steve said, it is incredibly difficult, um, and one might almost say a lost cause because you need political will in the country from which the leader came. But what you can do is to have a shot at getting his or her assets, and that may hurt them even more at the end of the day by taking their money. Let them get on with life, but if you can get the money back, then you are achieving something. Um, I don't know, hopefully with the papers that are put on the website from this conference, um, I submitted um, a short paper, it's about, I think, 20 pages long. It's a kind of briefing note on uh, recovering assets, recovering stolen assets. So I hope that will be on the website and then people can study that and see what options are open in order to recover assets. Um, and it, it does plug fairly strongly the idea of proceeding in the civil courts where the standard of proof is lower um, and you actually go for the assets rather than the individual. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I think Mr. Yeah. Baker would like to comment on something that yeah, um, Gladys said. I think there's a range of things that can be done to try and change things, so it's enormously difficult. I think journalists play an enormous part in, for instance, publicising cases like the Brazilian case where some money has gone back to Brazil or will go back to Brazil so that people's awareness is, is developed so they can see that things are happening and that people won't always tolerate um, kleptocrats, people stealing from countries. So I think there's got to be a lot of publicity, journalism, there's got to be, for those countries that have a rule of law and an effective court system, there's got to be the prosecution of people where there can be prosecution, there's got to be asset recovery where there can be asset recovery and some publicity that this won't be tolerated. And slowly, hopefully, somebody will listen. Uh, you would like to comment, yeah. again? I think there are a whole range of things. We are not helpless as people. Uh, we can do many things, you know. There's a very famous book by an author called E.P. Thompson. It's called The Making of the English Working Class. And the question he poses is, how did these people, who are thoroughly dispossessed, poor, trodden down, how did they manage to win something? How did they manage to make their concerns other people's? And when you read it, people use street theater, theater, music, poetry, leaflets, oratory. So we have many things we can all do at different levels. But of course, with the internet, uh, different kind of communication is also possible to make grassroots aware. The issues you raised about the corruption or the involvement of Western institutions, a few years ago, John Christensen, myself, Richard Murphy, and Ray Baker from uh, GFI in the uh, US, we gave evidence to a parliamentary committee in the US. It's called Africa All Party Parliamentary Group, and they produced eventually a report. It's called The Other Side of Coin. And in there, we did argue exactly what you're saying. We said, actually, you've got to look at the involvement of Western institutions, particularly when we were discussing Abacha's money. The UK government, Abacha used a number of bank accounts in London. To this day, the UK government has not officially <coughs> named any of those banks or explained how it is done, and probably hasn't even returned the money either, though Switzerland and Jersey uh, repatriated large amounts. So I'm saying some of these issues are documented. We have tried at a particular level, but we are not helpless. We can, w there are more of us than any of these leaders, and uh, we can do things. Uh, then it's Tina, and then it's uh, another question, and uh, then we have to wrap up. Okay, well, I think we got some really useful comments uh, from the audience now. Um, for this issue about how to translate uh, all these uh, agreements into action at the country level is really uh, the next step and, and something we are, we are not done with this work until it's, it, it is implemented in, in practical rules and enforced. Um, and I think this uh, comment from Sierra Leone about um, uh, but, uh, th what is the difference between tax fraud and the thief on the street? I think a main difference is that we have victims, 
very, it's very clear who the victims are when there is a thief on the street. When tech, on tax fraud, it's not that easy to see it. And, and uh, even if you have, have victims, definitely, I didn't mean to say, uh, but, but it's, it's, it, there are not, we don't, not so many people complain. Michael, and then... Let me just, my question is, a common thief end up in jail, and then the tax invader... Oh yes, I see. Is the EU. And uh, the third so issue... Look at them, these two issues. The one is a hill and the other one is in jail. Yes. The common city is in jail. But we, but but crime that is uh, observable and uh, easy to detect is often punished more easily than financial crime. That's something we know. Um, I just one final issue is that is um, the issue about responsibility. Where to place responsibility? Um, and of of course, uh, we, we have a huge responsibility in OECD countries, absolutely. But at the same time, the leaders who grab and steal, they are also, they cannot, it's not a, it, it, it is a very, very clear responsibility on them too. So, so it takes two to tango, definitely. But there are also many, many uh, um, forms of fraud and corruption that takes place without any any other uh, companies from other countries involved. So, so um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, short. yeah. Short. No, I would say that uh, a victim for a common thief goes to the police and, uh, and puts on a case. But when you see tax avoidance, who is going to the police? Okay, somebody needs to go to the police. Okay, is it the civil society organizations that are going to the police? I mean, somebody must file a complaint in order for the police to, to start. Better formulate it. Okay, <laughs> we have one question there and one final uh, on the right hand side, and then <coughs> short comments from you. Um, my name is Adamson from Zambia. I work with uh, Christian Aid and Church Aid and Norwegian Church Aid. I wanted to find out, um, I've been listening very attentively especially to the way forwards, the solutions. To me, they sound more on a long-term basis, and they have critical stakeholders involved, which won't be easy to penetrate. Is, are there short-term measures for Africa? Because by the time we find the Google glasses, in the first place, where to find them, how to find them, how to wear them, <laughs> and then start concentrating on those little, little small boxes, by the time we really found the actual box, there will be nothing left for Africa. What's the best way to fix this thing so that it produces the tangible result? Because what we are talking about, it all ends up to poverty. And we are saying, we have the minerals. Why are we poor? When is it going to translate to a common man to, find, to, to feel that, that effect? Otherwise, it will be meaningless if it takes that long in Africa, a long time ago, we used to fix things through war. I think from, uh, you talked about that. We can't do that anymore. If there's the greatest mistake an African country would do is to, to, to go to war. Because then, the worst will come in the name of providing security for civilians. And then they will take more natural resources than they are taking now. So wh wh what, what is it uh, in a short term that Africa can do civil society can do that is going to produce this tangible result if you go to Africa you will really see how poor people are and when you go to these uh, countries where these mining companies uh, come from you see how comfortable people are and then you when you start looking at the two it's it's a little bit tricky whether really they are joint ventures between the south and and the north to read between the lines it's it brings us back to colonialism. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, your final question, question. comments? Yes, um, a very short one. Um, um, all these uh, financial secrets, all these structures um, are only possible because um, uh, legal entities, corporations, have the rights, there's no obstacles it seems, to split themselves up in an infinite number of different entities who then are by the, our legal systems treated as different legal entities, while well, in fact they are one. If, if a natural person does that, we call that someone with a multiple personality disorder, he's considered extremely...
dangerous for himself <laughs> and very, very unhappy. And uh, why <coughs> do we not consider, um, well, why do we not put any obstacles to this splitting up of, of legal entities in, in our system? It's, it's so bizarre, absurd, and obviously, uh, in this case, not, not detrimental to the health of the legal entity, but to society as a whole. Thank you very much. Uh, you now have one minute each to conclude, and you don't have to uh, answer both. You can choose. Mm. Would you like to start? I think the question from the gentleman on the left is in intractable. Um, and I wish there was an easy answer. I suspect if you said to Western um, companies, and they were speaking to you completely honestly, uh, and said, how can you not pay bribes? Can you not be party to an arrangement where if you're not paying them yourself, you know there's a lot of theft, huge amount of theft going on. They say, well, if we don't turn a blind eye, then the Chinese will do the job. And so if every um, Western um, company said, we're not going to do any business at all with any country where there might be the abstraction of value from the country by a, a corrupt politician, then the corrupt politician will say, thank you very much, we'll do business with with somebody else, which is not the answer you want to hear. So I was, I was going to suggest that perhaps the quick fix is to do your best to elect governments who aren't corrupt <laughs> and to, for us to put pressure on our companies not to be party to um, the theft from the treasury of um, developing countries in, in, in whatever way that takes place. But it's a long, we're in for the long term, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Thank you. Mrs. Zika. Yeah, I mean, they are very, very challenging and demanding questions, but I think one thing we have to do is uh, not run along with the idea that we have globalization. What we have is westernization. Many of these West co corporations are, have headquarters in the Western world. Ultimately, corporation is a child of the state. Only the state can give birth to it. Therefore, like any other parent, it has a duty to impose obligation on the unruly child. And the Western governments have to take responsibility that their co uh, companies operating headquartered within their borders have obligations in other places and they are discharged. So I think we have to put our responsibility onto them. Banking crisis has shown us that all banks ultimately have a national home, though they are said to be uh, global, because ultimately only particular states could bail them out. So the same should apply here. And I think the other problem is uh, we have to look at all sorts of economic ideologies too. Uh, this is why this problem is somewhat intrac intractable, because this idea that firm has to maximize shareholder wealth is an utter nonsense and has to be challenged to its core. Once we are able to challenge that, develop some mechanisms, then we can do lots of other things. But in the first instance, I would say Western governments have to take at least the responsibility for what entities they have allowed to flourish do. And of course, developing countries can deal with something within their own jurisdiction too. Thank you. Fria? Yes. Uh, a lot of the things that we have been talking about is about the long term. But there are measures that can be done almost immediately. Uh, I've been around consulting governments uh, and measures have been taken into law or tax administrations have been given help. And uh, that has given uh, pretty immediate raise in taxes or improvement of the tax base of uh, those countries. So, for example, it can be just the easy measure of moving uh, derivatives out in a separate tax base. Almost all African countries have uh, legal systems that uh, facilitate such a move, and it will limit an, a, a, an enormous uh, outflow of capital in the form of derivatives. So that, that's examples of measures. There are others. We'll soon probably <coughs> publish a, a list of approximately 20 of them that can be uh, taken into immediate use uh, almost uh, in less than one year. Thank you very much. Tina? 
Um, well, I, uh, of course, OECD countries and uh, firms and uh, financial institutions in the north, they have a heavy responsibility, but there is a lot of low-hanging fruits in, in, in developing countries and, and, and a lot of things that, uh, that are being done and, and uh, can be done to get quick results. And, and for example, on accounting, the national audit offices are, are getting uh, stronger in many countries. And I know there are several people from Tanzania here. And the national audit office in Tanzania is more and more independent. It, it, has, it matters. It has an impact on how money can be spent. Political corruption is getting more difficult. And we also see it when it comes to contracts in natural resource production and, uh, and utility uh, contracts, it is getting more difficult to, to get to, to be corrupt on, on some of these big deals, uh, and that's really important. So, so I think there are, are, are many, many things that actually are happening. Uh, so there are some improvements. There are notable uh, improvements going on. Thank you. Nils, I have word. nothing to add, I think. Uh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you very much to the panel.